If you can all please uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We're ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing, Barb Barnett, our police chaplain, is going to give us our invocation. Lord God, we begin this evening by inviting your presence here. We ask your blessing and your wisdom would be obvious, Lord, in the decisions made and the things discussed. We also ask your blessing upon those to be acknowledged tonight, those who have blessed and benefited our community. And we're thankful for their skill and their talent. And Lord, we also are mindful tonight of the things that have happened in Mexico today. We pray for those people. We pray for the families. We pray for those that are the rescuers and those that are meeting the needs of the people. In the name of the Lord, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I'm going to call on a special presentation, an update from the Arts and Culture Commission. And then I'll be in 10 minutes. And then after that, you go, and then I'll, I'll be back. Okay. Is, is our mayor coming back? Okay. All right. Um, greetings, City Council. It's great to see you and our city manager and city staff. I'm Sandra Pocha Peña. I'm a Santa Ana native, an arts professional, and I'm the chair of the Santa Ana Arts Commission. And I'm here to present a report on the activities of our Arts Commission. We were voted in almost three years ago um, to facilitate and advise on our city's art endeavors, and also to tap into uh, our regional arts field and industries, which of course would bring a uh, wealth of opportunities in cultivating city revenue, tourism, jobs, educational opportunities, personal enrichment for our residents, and of course, an increasing quality of life. Uh, our first uh, year was spent uh, developing our infrastructure in creating, uh, we commissioned an arts master plan and we spent the entire year engaging with the city to uh, get the feedback of our residents and our local arts, arts uh, artists and uh, arts industries. Uh, to create a roadmap so that we could develop um, a good comprehensive uh, infrastructure for the arts here in Santa Ana. So we've completed that process and now we're in the implementation phase. We've created a subcommittee, uh, the implementation subcommittee to um, begin applying the findings that we came to in the um, in the arts master plan. We're also hiring a dedicated, thank you for supporting the hiring of a dedicated arts liaison. We've had over 175 applicants for this position. So we're really getting the cream of the crop as far as our arts professionals in our region. There's a lot of interest. There's a, a lot of, um, a lot of people are really rooting for us. So once we get that individual on board, we're going to be forming another subcommittee, and that's the development uh, subcommittee, so that we can start to really focus on one of the main reasons that we were formed, which is to create opportunities that will bring jobs, city revenue, new industries, um, and create, of course, uh, uh, support the uh, SAUSD's art uh, enrichment programs, so that every student in the city can have access to extracurricular arts um, instruction. And also, of course, we have a wonderful arts nonprofits here in the city, and it's been something that we've been involved with as a city for over 100 years. You know, since the days of the 1800s, even longer, we have a great tradition of Fandango, of uh, muralism, uh, believe it or not, even opera with the presence of Madame Mojeska, great theater and vaudeville tradition, and uh, architecture and such. So all of these wonderful strengths we're really hoping to develop um, in, in future... Um, in future years. So just giving a quick overview, uh, 
<clears throat> Some of the things uh, that are coming up are the Wings of the City, um, a major exhibition, our first major city exhibition is coming. It's going to be nine uh, major pieces from a Mexico City um, artist, Jorge Marin, and the unveiling is October 27th, so I, I hope that you'll all make some time to be there at the unveiling. It's going to be, these uh, sculptures are going to be distributed all over downtown, all the way from the courthouse, the historic courthouse, all the way through the artist village and over to uh, French, to the Calle Cuatro Plaza over on French and Fourth. So um, we are also... We're also launching our first downtown public art project with the downtown restroom art panels. So we've selected a, a, a group of local artists to, um, to post up their original designs around that structure, that new structure there uh, between 3rd and 4th off of Birch. And that'll be happening within the next month. Uh, we've also been conducting, in partnership with Downtown Inc., um, some artist roundtables, and we're, of course, supporting other nonprofits uh, creating similar convenings. And um, we've made great progress in tapping into our regional arts leaders and um, professionals in creating independent review panels for all of our grants, all of our um, uh, contests and such are all independently judged and of course we're building up that that network that we've so needed here in Santa Ana. So um, I'm sure you've all gotten your packet with the uh, with the details of who won the newest Investing in the Artist grant. Um, almost a dozen local artists and arts organizations have received about $80,000 and we ha this is our third year of giving out these monies to, to local individual artists and nonprofits to really jumpstart the arts here in our community. And of course, everything selected has a clear clearly demonstrated uh, public benefit. So either it takes place in Santa Ana, is offered for free for the benefit of the residents of Santa Ana. So um, looking forward to keeping y'all posted on uh, as we continue to move forward. Uh, hopefully once we get our arts lays on uh, on board, we can start to participate in some of our larger economic initiatives like participating in the Arts and Economic Prosperity Study that's put together by the um, Americans for the Arts group and uh, also the um, Otis um, Arts uh, and Economic Impact you know, Studies. So as we start to take part in these kinds of studies and we start to tap into and create that pattern recognition of the creative industries that we already have in Santa Ana. For example, for the County of Orange, we're a center for printing. Almost all the printing in Orange County happens here in Santa Ana. Uh, we've also recently have become a, a, an increasingly more popular destination for filming, for film and TV. Some of you might have recalled the, the recent filming for American Horror Story. Um, and we can cultivate all these industries or billion dollar industries that have really been passing us over. They've been passing us over going from LA to San Diego or even out of state. So all of our local guilds, our trade unions are really invested in retaining um, all that business here in Southern California and they're really invested in supporting Santa Ana as being a filming destination. So there's so many industries like that, especially with our entertainment industry with the observatory uh, being such a su such a flourishing venue that's now expanded into San Diego and now Long Beach. Uh, of course, we have Rickenbacker guitars, which are manufactured locally, which also bring in great recognition to our city. So we've got a lot of great um, uh, thriving industries. We just recently got um, McLogan's, which is a major print supplier. Um, so. As we build these networks, we're going to tap into these businesses, and we look forward to really creating a lot of opportunity here for all of our local residents. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you, uh, um, Sandra. I was going to call you Pocha. Thank you, Sandra. Um, is there any uh, comments at this time from our the dais? Yes, Councilman Solorio. Yes. Uh, thank you, Pocha, for all your <laughs> great work. Uh, you know, you do a lot to inspire uh, not just fellow artists in our community, but, but young people. And I know the, the, the grants program that you mentioned also involves a lot of young people, community organizations, and it's making a real difference. I really want to 
want to thank you and the rest of your team because I know you you know work as a team. Yes. Uh, and so thank you so much for your contributions to our community. Council Member Sarmiento, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo some of what uh, the councilman said and thank you for all the leadership you and the commission have provided. And I know that you uh, uh, we had a film festival this weekend and. Was it this weekend or over a over past couple of weeks? The, there are, our, the OC Film Fiesta is going to begin on October 6th, and I believe Victor Payan will be speaking on it, perhaps later in the meeting. Y'all will have some uh, flyers, I think, distributed during this meeting as well, and that's October 6th, and it continues for two weekends. Okay. And we're, doing, uh, we're having a premiere of a, a, of a Chavela Vargas documentary and um, a lot of other great films. Well, to see all the great things, I mean, even at Bowers, we saw the Frida e exhibition, the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Film Fiesta, and all the different things that are arts related. And we all know that, um, look, a community or a city without the arts is like a soulless community. So um, thank you for and making sure that we continue down this path and making sure it's a priority. We know that um, without a commission, it would have been really difficult for us to continue our commitment to that. So you as commissioners are on the front line making sure that we're looking at all the opportunities and making sure we have these amenities available to our community. So thank you for all the hard work that you all do as volunteers. Thank you, Councilman Sarmiento. And Sandra, I do have a question, and, and, and congratulations on being the chair of the Arts and Culture Commission, and I'm wanting to thank you and the rest of the commissioners for your commitment and dedication. Um, you know, it, it pretty much is a volunteer, you know, position, even though we give you a, a tiny stipend, um, you all do commit a lot, and there are times that sometimes we don't recognize that on this dais, and sometimes even, you know, our staff may not recognize that, that you're an extension of us. Uh, when we appoint you, we, it is our hope that uh, you will carry out some of the, 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 the ideas that we all have and, and you work with our community and our residents to flush those out so that we can have some good policies and work uh, together. And it's my hope that we will continue uh, to do that. And But just wanting to appreciate you and, 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 and the commissioners for the work that you all do on behalf of this mayor and city council. One of the questions that I do had that um, when we were um, we established the Arts and Culture Commission was the component of the sister cities. And uh, we had a great conversation. I think we had a three hour um, a, a meeting uh, over lunch uh, not too long ago. And I discussed with you in particular the sister cities. Can you share with us where are you all at with that process? Have you been working <coughs> with staff? Um, what, what are some next steps? Um, one of the reasons we, we asked you I want to thank our city manager um, for um, you know making sure that we are having these special presentations so that we hear from each of the various commissions so that we get an update from the chairs so that we're in sync and, and where we're wanting to move forward but that was one of the priorities of this council mm -hmm. was to establish a sister city well with the sister city we did have one meeting as a as a subcommittee we did establish a sister city subcommittee uh, I think it was maybe we convened in November or December of last year, and then shortly thereafter, the subcommittee was suspended. Um, during the subcommittee, we were trying to create the criteria for which the selection for the sister cities would, you know, what, what criteria we would take into account. Um, there was a desire to find a match that was not just a match for arts and culture, but also a match for, you know, economic match. Um, there's, of course, a lot of favorites, you know, a lot of different, there's a lot of, of, of a wealth of culture throughout Mexico and a lot of very strong contenders. So some of us, I know myself, I felt that it would be good to maybe open up the uh, process and um, an announce that we are, you know, interested in a Mexican sister city and then have the different groups. Uh, we have several majority populations here from, uh, I think, three or four Mexican states. Give a presentation about, you know, what, uh, work with the consulate to give a presentation about what those uh, regions, each of those states offers, the ones that are interested, and then, you know, dependent on the criteria come to some kind of a consensus. Um, as far as I know, to actually establish a sister city, there's a cost involved. There's an annual fee to be a part of Sister Cities International. And I believe Jorge has that amount. It's not little, right? 
It's about 23,000 a year. And that just really facilitates, you know, the paperwork and, and so that you can use the kind of trademarked sister city designation. So because, you know, we had so much transition, you know, we had, we've had a lot of staff come and go last year, especially, I th or the beginning part of this year, I think we put things on hold as far as, as that subcommittee, okay. I think it was kind of suspended, right? And, and it can be reconvened once, you know, you all give us direction that, that we're ready to to open up that process. But um, I do think that from the commissioners that are present right now on the commission, I think there's support to open up the process um, to interested states. I know Guanajuato is a very strong contender. I know we have a lot of folks from um, Jalisco and, uh, you know, Tierra Caliente region. So it would be great to, you know, open it up to, to see what's possible. Maybe we could even have multiple sister cities. Well, hopefully we could go back with Jorge and explore some of those options because, you know, the, when we talk about economic economic development and, and arts and culture, I just recently got back from, um, from, from Madrid, Spain and Toledo and also um, Lisbon and you know, one of the things that um, I, I noticed immediately that what they embrace is culture and art and, and that sense of place. And we have that sense of place here. We have to embrace it. We have to embrace it with partners. I think almost every city here in Orange County has a sister city in exception for, 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 for Santana. And so I think it would be important for us to continue to have that dialogue, making sure that we have the right partner. Uh, because again, it's just not about art and culture, but it's also about the, um, the economic opportunities that we can have with one of those cities um, in Mexico or whether it be somewhere in China, Korea, whatever have you. Um, um, I know we have um, some certain cities that have multiple sister cities, and so I'm not asking for multiple, but I'm asking for us to to, to take a look because I, I do see the opportunities. And so I just wanted to, to make mention of that and thank you again uh, for um, giving this presentation here today. I think uh, it was um, very good to, to hear from um, you and your perspective and your and, and your colleagues uh, who sit on that commission. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And also, just so you know, uh, I think the intention was to have a sister city in Latin America, starting with Mexico, because it's a, it's a finite period of time, I think five years or so, that each designation is for. And, uh, and then we wanted to have a sister city in Europe, one in Asia, and one locally within the U.S. So it opens up a lot of options, certainly. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you very Thank you. much. Next, we're going to go in, um, going to presentations. Our mayor will be coming back. He had to go up upstairs for a couple of minutes, and so we do have some recognition. And at this time, I would like to uh, bring up um, Fabi Hakom with the program coordinator of the Orange County Immigrant uh, Youth. Um, I'm going to be presenting her uh, in regard in regards to the observance of National Hispanic Heritage Month, and then I will be asking for Matthew Acuna for 24 Hour Fitness, and then we'll proceed with the other presentations. Great, it's like they all come up here. We do have a lot of wear asses in this proclamation, but from the 11 years that I've been on this city council, I, I've had the great fortune to every year observe and making sure that we recognize National Hispanic Latino uh, Month here in the city of Santa Ana, knowing that we are 78 to 80 percent Latino, so wanting to make sure that we do embrace. And over the years, I've been able to recognize, and I see some folks out here from the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We have been able to recognize a lot of people for their contributions. But the, this year, you know, in, in our selection, and, you know, I was thinking to myself and I was looking at, you know, really what is the theme this year and is really embracing and making sure what are young people doing out in this community, in particular in the Hispanic Latino community. And today, um, it, I want to thank you all, first off. For, and recognize you for the efforts that you have been contributing in this community, but also um, shed some light on why we really 
honor Hispanic Heritage Month. So let me read a little bit of when it was founded by our president and then highlight some of the work that you all are doing and then give you the opportunity to say a couple of words. So each year, America, America observes National Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15 to October 15. The, observ the observation uh, started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon Johnson and was expanded by President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover a 30-day period. Hispanics are one of the fastest growing populations in the United States. The presence of this community is vital in the growth and the, the stability of our city and of course our nation. September of course is National Hispanic Heritage Month at, through October but today we are honoring the Santa, um, here in Santa Ana, we're honoring the Orange County Immigrant Youth United, which they go by your acronym, O-C-I-Y-U. And so they are a youth-led organization that advocates for the rights of undocumented immigrants to, leave, to live free from exploitation, persecution, and by mo mobilizing undocumented youth to advocate for their communities. And as you all know, some of the issues that we've been experiencing at the federal level, and in particular, the support of, of DACA, and I think, um, you know, I know my colleagues up here later on have a resolution that they'll be moving forward, but beyond just DACA and, and, and some of the issues that you all have been taking, it's not only about youth, it's about your families. And, and that's one thing that I think we all need to recognize within the Hispanic and the Latino community, that it's not about individuals, it's about family. And here in this great community, we are one family, and we need to make sure that we are able to put our differences to the side and support our family that resides here in the city of Santa Ana. It doesn't matter if you're undocumented or not, we are all human beings. Um, we are all here to make sure that we are in a city that is able to thrive and so I'm excited to personally you know present you with this proclamation because the good work that you all have been doing sometimes goes unrecognized and sometimes many times people will say well what are they doing they're out there chanting they're out there you know um, you know asking for certain things but I, I want to tell you that the, the, growing up here in this city, there was a time where folks were not protesting, folks were not speaking up for themselves, and in particular, young people were not standing up for their rights. And it's with great pride to see here today, you know, as an elected official, that you all are standing up not only for your rights, you're standing up for your family's rights and the rights of this community. So I want to personally thank you all and recognize you and provide you. And I'm not going to read all the, the whereas, but I will just do the last part. And that says, now therefore we the mayor and city council of Santa Ana do hereby acknowledge and proclaim September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month and encourage all our residents in Santa Ana to join in celebrating the culture and traditions of the Hispanic communi community in appreciation of National Hispanic Heritage Month. This past weekend, we celebrated Fiestas Patrias. There was thousands of thousands of folks out there. It was really beautiful to see whether we were out there at the Grito or during the parade on Sunday. It was just a fabulous um, a, a weekend. And now here we are um, um, recognizing and proclaiming um, and making sure they were able to recognize your efforts. And so please say a couple of words, and then I'll go ahead and present you with the recognition. Um, oh, we want to say uh, thank you for Councilwoman uh, Mayor Pro Tem Michelle Martinez um, for um, having us here today. Um, and just a little bit, we recently had a march uh, that we called the Undocumented and Unafraid March, and it was in response to DACA being rescinded. However, um, we didn't frame it around DACA because, as she said, it goes beyond just us. Um, it's we want to make sure that this time around we don't leave anybody behind. We want to make sure that through that messaging we put um, out that this was a really good time for us to start unifying, for us to start including other members of our community that have been included, uh, as had been excluded from DACA, which includes members of our LGBTQ community, um, our parents, folks that maybe don't have families here but are still members of our community. And thank you to the council members that have been supportive of, of OCIYU and the collaborative work that we have been doing here in Santana. Um, but this is also a really good time for us to reach out and call out to the, um, the 
local legislators and the state and national legislators that have not um, that have been in negotiations uh, in, of, of something that has to do with our lives as undocumented people. Um, shout out to Council Member Solorio. Um, but at the same time, thank you to the council members and the local legislators that have been supportive of us. So, um, Council Member Benavides, Sarmiento Tinajero, um, and I'm pretty sure I'm missing one, but I forgot. Great, thank you so very much. So let me uh, give this to all of you. And again, on behalf of the mayor and council, you know, um, I hope that you will take care of this beautiful proclamation. And as I as I mentioned, I, I do honor someone every every year for their contributions, not only in the Santa Ana area, but uh, you know, throughout Orange County, but in particular the work that Latinos and Hispanics are really doing in this community. And sometimes we forget about our young people that you are making big contributions. And so. It matters, not only to me, but I know it matters to many of us on this dais that young people are actually contributing to, 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 to um, the Latino community as a whole and making sure that we stand up for our rights. So congratulations. Great. As they uh, head out, we'd like to call Matthew with 24 Hour Fitness. Matthew, are you here? Here comes Matthew. And so, 24 Hour Fitness just opened its second location in Santa Ana. I'm, ex I I'm excited. I love going to Main Place Mall. That's typically where I go to 24 Hour Fitness because right after that, I get to go through the mall or either do my nails or do a little shopping. So, it's always fun. But now they've actually just opened up around the corner from my house. So I'm no longer going to that 24-hour fitness and going to the 24-hour fitness where how many of you know where the smart and final uh, shopping center is on Edinger and Bristol across the street from Modern Day High School? Raise your hand. All right, well, that's where they've opened up, right? So it's really cool, exciting. And so I would like for you to share before I give you a certificate of recognition. I was in Sacramento last week, so I didn't get to go to your guys' opening. I was bummed out about that. But definitely excited that you guys decided to open a second site, uh, um, facility in the city of Santa Ana. Um, you know, the need of, of physical activity and making sure that we promote um, healthy facilities and to knowing that you guys are a partner and willing to open a second facility definitely realize that there is a need so if you can share with us really quickly Matthew what are some of the um, particulars about the club because I know it's a sport facility and you know if you guys have any incentives or offers to offer to our residents that'd be greatly appreciated all right good evening everybody thank you guys for having us um, we are really excited to be a part of Santa Ana the community itself has opened its arms very wide for all of us to be here, at basically like a big family, which was awesome. So when I was asked to have the opportunity to become one of the leadership teams that is able to lead the Santa Ana location, I was really excited. I was actually the first one to raise my hand. Um, it, it's a good feeling because everyone that walks in the doors is thanking us and we don't really know what they're thanking us for, but we're excited to have them. Um, we're making sure that we're, our arms are as big as open as just as much as theirs. Uh, we are partnered with Modern Day High School, which to me, I'm so thankful for making sure that our kids that are staying in school, that are attending Modern Day High School, are they're staying level-headed and they're staying healthy and they're staying happy and they're staying educated. And it's kind of the partnership with that is just the beginning. So we're excited to see where, where we go and we, we hope to see everybody there. And we do have a lot of amenities, so we hope to see all of you guys there. Great. So let me share a couple of those amenities because I think for a lot of us, we're, we're excited. As you mentioned, people are giving you hugs and you don't even know why because there hasn't been a facility. You know, we're a very park poor city because we're a very dense city and kind of built out. So we don't have a lot of open space. And so any kind of recreational facility is an added bonus. And so definitely 24-hour fitness and you all being open 24 hours a day, specifically for our working families that sometimes can't just do the 8 to 5 kind of uh, 
uh, deal and work out. So sometimes they need to go into the gym at 4.30, 5 a.m. or go in late hours. And so it's exciting. I typically get show up about 5 a.m. And so um, I, I need to get work done. And so I, I'm there early in the morning. I try to get out by 6.30. So look forward to seeing you. But they have a 40,000 uh, square feet um, spectacular workout spl- um, space. They have um, Zumba, Pilates. Um, they have a lot of cardio equipment. They also have a kids club. They have a lap pool. And so it, I have yet to go. So I'm, I'm hoping to go this weekend. Right. So I'm, I'm very excited. You all have a personal trainers. You have a sauna, steam room and a lot more. So this is really exciting. A super sports facility is not the traditional 24 hour facility. They do have basketball courts. Yes, they do. They have bas- We see um, we Al Green here, former Laker. Yay. Go Lakers. Al Green's in the house. AC Green, did I just call you Al Green? AC Green. Oh my God. So on behalf, on behalf of the city of Santa Ana, we want to uh, provide a certificate of recognition awarded to 24 Hour Fitness, the Santa Ana Edinger Super Sports Facility in recognition of your grand opening and thank you for your service and commitment to Santa Ana. Great. And next, I'm going to call upon Councilman Ben Sarmiento. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, you know, I don't often get starstruck, but we've got a star here up in the front row that I just had to take a selfie with. And that's, it's AC Green, not Al. Al Green is the singer, unless AC. And- so let's give a big round of applause to him. <laughs> Councilman, nice job on bringing him out here. But uh, look, I can go on and on. I'm a, I'm a diehard Laker fan, so I'm like, I'm like a kid in a candy shop right now. So thank you for being here, AC. But um, seriously, what I want to do is I want to uh, recognize another group of stars who are going to make you proud. Um, These are the folks that uh, worked on the city's efforts to form the Immigration Legal Defense Fund. So can I have Samir Ashar, Ruben Barreto, Kimberly Castro, let me put on my glasses here, make sure I don't ruin anybody's name, Natalie Cedeño, Airo Cortez, Andani Alcantara Diaz, Eric Dominguez, Eric Garcia, Norma Garcia Guillen, Karina Gutierrez, Roberto Herrera, Fabi Jacom, Jennifer Coe, Annie Lai, Brennan Lowe, Carlos Perrea, Claudia Perez, Blanca Robles, Sabrina Rivera, Jose Servin, Alexis Teodoro, and the vecindario Lacey de Acción. Come on up, you guys. Come on up here. And- so look, uh, heroes are found everywhere. They're found on the basketball court. They're found as artists, they're found as different things in their, in their uh, careers of choice and their professions and different things. But this is a group of folks that uh, I'm very, very proud to have up here with me and represent an effort that um, I hope is going to inspire us all. And as they all come up and get assembled here, I want you to know that it's, um, it's a unique uh, group of folks who felt it important to represent um, the needs and the priorities of uh, folks in the community that have been very, very scared. It's been a difficult time for a lot of members of our community because of some of the hostility that we've seen from the administration. Um, right off the bat, there was um, you know, an effort to um, you know, deport folks, to separate families, and this caused a lot of fear and a lot of shame in our community, unfortunately, because, you know, it drove this problem back uh, down again. And uh, look, we had made so many strides as a community, as a country, under the past administration that we thought this was, uh, this was done. We thought that this was an, uh, an issue that we had put behind us. Unfortunately, it's um, been revived, and we needed champions. We needed advocates. We needed people to speak with one voice, to be united in an effort to represent families and kids, kids who were no longer going to school, parents who no, were no longer going to work, people who weren't shopping and doing commerce anymore in our city because of the fear that they had. So 
These folks brought it upon themselves to um, create a special fund and urge the city council to be a leader in this, to create a legal defense fund for families that were low income and undocumented that were going to be facing deportation, that were going to be taken away from a country that they've lived in for years, right? So these are folks that, um, you know, we saw that were our neighbors, that were our relatives, that were our friends, people that we grew up with. And so they all came and, and spoke very articulately, loudly and convincingly to the extent that um, this city council passed a resolution to fund this legal defense fund to the amount of $65,000. Not only that, but because of that seed money, we have a nonprofit that's looking at augmenting that to the tune of about $100,000, and that's the Vera Foundation. So let's give them a huge round of applause for getting that done. You know, in, 2000, in, in December 2016, the city council declared itself a sanctuary city, and a lot of people think, well, it's a sanctuary city. That means you're going to let you know, people who've committed crimes um, you know, uh, give them some sort, of, um, some sort of protection. That's not the case. When you, when you dig down deeper, you realize that what you do with, um, with folks who are in fear, they no longer report crimes. They no longer are witnesses to crimes. They don't help prosecute those folks that are preying on the very people that we're supposed to be protecting. I think what our sanctuary city policy has done is it's made people have the courage, the trust, to come out and say, these crimes are being uh, inflicted upon our community. And I think that's where we are, and that's where the city's been. Later on in the uh, meeting, you're going to see that we have a resolution before the city council to uh, adopt a resolution that is, um, that is urging Congress to, uh, uh, to turn around the rescission of the DACA program that unfortunately is going to hurt 800,000 of, uh, you know, of our brightest youth that are going to school, that are working hard, that are in our military. So this is the type of leadership that these young people and folks who are committed, and it's a great group of youth, uh, community activists, it's attorneys, it's uh, law schools, it's bar associations, it's just a whole lot of people from a cross-section of the community that realized that this was so important that we all needed to gather and, and make this one statement of opposition and stand up for people who couldn't stand up for themselves. And that's what I think this community is about. And that's the best that Santa Ana has, has to offer when we have folks do that. So I was proud to march with many students who were DACA students in, uh, in uh, our parade over the weekend and the Fiestas Patrias, and they joined me. Um, so I felt honored and privileged, and I feel honored and privileged to be with these uh, young folks behind me as well. So I want to you know, step aside and let somebody speak on behalf of the group because we, um, you know, we have a very long agenda and we want to make sure that we're able to summarize everything that this group has done. But, you know, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all the residents and neighbors and people that we care about and love, I want to thank you on their behalf, on behalf of a grateful city. So thank you very, very much. And let me have, um, who's going to speak on behalf of the group? Claudia? Yeah. I'm going to introduce you to Claudia Perez. Claudia Perez is going to be addressing us and telling us a little bit about the hard work that these young folks have done. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, today we thank the City Council for recognizing the efforts of um, the immigrant rights advocates for our involvement in bringing sanctuary and universal representation to our immigrant and undocumented community in the city of Santana. We take pride in the work we have done to bring relief to our communities such as um, legal defense to families and immigration detention, sanctuary for the undocumented community, investment in youth. But we will continue to fight. We need to expand sanctuary for our immigrant and undocumented community that can't afford to live here. We will continue to work working together with the city to provide sanctuary for the youth, for the LGBTQ community, for the undocumented community, for the parents of DACA recipients. Sanctuary is the right to live and thrive. 
We support the call for additional protections for the immigrant community. The city of Santana can do a couple of things, such as establish rent control and tenant rights, a just cause eviction policy, and a commitment to use city-owned land for community benefits. We understand that sanctuary was just the first step to address the needs of immigrants in our city. Santana can continue moving forward the continued progress of bringing equity and justice to the immigrant and undocumented community in Orange County. Thank you. Don't go too far, Claudia. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand these certificates over to Claudia so she can go ahead and hand these out to everybody individually. Um, you know, some of the organizations that are joining us is Re Resilience OC, uh, Santa Ana Building Healthy Communities, the UC, School of, uh, UC Irvine School of Law Immigrants Rights Clinic, the Western State School of Law uh, uh, Immigrants Clinic, um, the Orange County Hispanic Bar Association, the Public Law Center, uh, Vecindario Lacey, and many, many more. But it's just, again, um, as we said, it's not just DACA, it's not just a sanctuary city. This is a process to make sure that we protect everybody in our community because we certainly don't want anybody to feel inferior. We don't, certainly don't want anybody to live in fear. And uh, we want people to know that San Santa Ana is standing up with you all. So thank you all very much. And let's take a quick photograph. What do you say? All right. I now call upon uh, Councilmember Jose Solorio. Tough act to follow, a lot of energy with all the young folks. It's great. Uh, as we all know, we have some fantastic nonprofits in Santa Ana, uh, but I'm here to tell you, as many of you know already, we also have some outstanding nonprofits in other parts of Orange County that still give a lot to our community. Uh, and I have one uh, nonprofit that I want to recognize and their board. Uh, it's the Museum of Teaching and Learning, and we have some board members starting with their great leader, Greta Nagel, come on up. We also have uh, board members Mike Sabramski, um, Lauren Dahl, uh, and uh, Minor Duncan. Please come forward. Uh, there's uh, others on the board that, that couldn't join us, but uh, I'll mention uh, Mary Deming and Michael Hobashi and Eva Pasma. Uh, this board here and their staff again, of the Museum of Teaching and Learning, work to implement uh, their mission, which is an interesting mission, and that is to educate people about education. Because there's a lot of education that's out there that people don't know about. Uh, and they do this through exhibitions and events that tell important stories of national and international significance for students of all ages, so that includes young people, but also you know, old, older folks like us as well. Uh, this museum is also a museum that's on the move uh, because they have traveling uh, exhibitions that are on demand throughout the West. Uh, they have one that's getting ready to go to Los Angeles. They've been here to St. Anna before. Um, one of their highlights and that really struck a positive chord with this community uh, dealt with a key school integration court case, uh, one that happened right here in Orange County uh, in the 1940s, but many of us weren't around in the, in the 40s or, or, or weren't aware. Uh, and this organization, the Museum of Teaching and Learning, learning educate our community about it. 
And that exhibit, and I have here, they have so many excellent postcards. The exhibit is called A Class Action, uh, and it deals with uh, a very important court case that was precedent setting uh, that really had it not been for this case, we wouldn't have had uh, a success with the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, this exhibit, in fact, got also a national award uh, for its expert telling of the amazing local story of Mendes versus Westminster, uh, a key case, and from that Mexican uh, segregate segregation was ended in California and soon across the country. Uh, it led to the desegregation of, of those schools here in California. Uh, and this particular uh, exhibition was so good that it even got called to Sacramento to present there. So that really is, you know, then a, a, a national, a statewide uh, uh, significance. Uh, they also have uh, a newer exhibit, for example, called Two Roads, One Journey. Uh, and it's about bringing together the power and cultural influences of education in China and the United States, uh, showcasing points of pride and challenge for both countries. Uh, the exhibit will take visitors on a thought-provoking journey uh, into what goes on inside these dynamically different fourth generation, well, they'll, they'll teach it to fourth generation classrooms. So, you know, China and the U.S., obviously big, uh, you know, world uh, superpowers. And so for communities here in Santa Ana and, and throughout California to learn about that uh, is, is amazing. Um, we also have, uh, you know, more giving from, uh, you know, th this, this family, uh, Greta in particular, because their son, uh, Paul Nagel, also directs another great nonprofit called the Bicycle Tree uh, in Santa Ana. So you probably have seen at many fairs this exhibit, yes, this exhibit that uh, teaches young people about the importance of, of biking, you know, the, the health and fitness aspects, and showing kids how to, you know, fix their bikes and everything, you know, bike related. So it, it's my great honor to to recognize the Museum of Teaching and Learning, uh, and it would be my honor to have, uh, you know, to have their, their, their great leader, uh, Greta, say a few words about the program. Let's give them a big round of applause. Our headquarters are in that faraway town called Fullerton, California. Um, we're near Cal State Fullerton, and how do we do what we do? We have a board of seven people, but we have dozens and dozens of volunteers who step up for a variety of reasons. We have partners like OC Parks, and uh, that's how we were able to open the Mendez exhibit at the, at the courthouse, just the historic courthouse a couple blocks away. We come to Santa Ana for, for many reasons, and we were here just this weekend for a big event that we threw at the Bowers, and we had 26 artists and all kinds of people having a good time at the Bowers to celebrate the arts and education. Just this afternoon, we worked with the, the director of the Heritage Museum of Orange County. That's right here in Santa Ana, in South Santa Ana, and if you haven't been there, I encourage you to appreciate all the museums in this wonderful county of ours, and uh, we're proud of our exhibitions. It takes us a long time to develop them because we bring in a new team of scholars every time we do a new exhibition. And so they're the ones who, who guide us about the words that should go there, but we aim to communicate with not little kids. We say we serve people ages 9 to 109. <laughs> And that's the way our world is, is coming. You, you see a lot of people doing a lot of things, including lead our nation when they're senior citizens. I'd like to say just a, a couple more words because this is a big world we're in, and, uh, and we certainly have a lot to learn about it. But, but it's also important to learn about how people learn because we can all be better learners. Maybe you haven't been to China, but our lead scholar was there 73 times, and she tells us that there's a lot we can learn from the people of China in their education system, and they're coming here by the hundreds and thousands to find out about how we do things so creatively. But they do pretty well in math. Have you seen those scores? We could do a lot better. 
And so, uh, so we, we want to share this kind of knowledge with the world, and we're working on it. We've been to every major city in California. We're on our way to L.A. with the China exhibition, and we're on our way to Sacramento with a class action, which is a story of the five families who fought the Mexican segregation of schools, and right here in Santa Ana was one of the cities. So, you've heard of Mendes versus Westminster here if you haven't heard about it before. And we're really proud because uh, one of the people who helps us build our exhi exhibitions is a, a really cool guy named Gonzalo Mendes Jr. So, thank you, everybody. This is a nice honor. So we thank Greta and the rest of the board for all the education and all the service that they've provided and will continue to provide to our community here in Santa Ana. Congratulations. Uh, and on behalf of our mayor and city council, Greta, here's a nice certificate for you. One for Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, for all your great work and all your entrepreneurialism as well with LCP Tracker and everything else, uh, helping uh, workers make sure they get a living wage and that they don't get cheated out of their wages. So thank you for your commitment through that. And Minor Duncan, thank you for your service as well. Uh, and for the folks that couldn't make it, we have a certificate as well. So on behalf of the mayor, let's give him one big round of applause. Again. Juan Villegas? He's there. If I can have Mr. A.C. Green step up uh, to the front with Mr. Uh, Carlos Muñiz and Johnny Gutierrez. Council member Sarmiento is going to join us up here. Big fan. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. A.C. Green. <laughs> Former NBA professional basketball player with the uh, Los Angeles Lakers, Phoenix Suns, Dallas Mavericks, Miami Heat. I think you have about 11, 1,192 consecutive games. Is that, <laughs> that's why they, get, they call him the Iron Man, because, wow, what a work ethic. Well, Mr. Uh, A.C. Green, if you can please step up, sir. He uh, generally, generously uh, started the A.C. Green Foundation to host the annual leadership program. This program was brought to Century High School just a few weeks ago here in Santa Ana for the first time, and we... Uh, wanted to recognize him for his contribution uh, to the city of Santa Ana. And if, sir, if you could please say a few words uh, about your foundation and about the, uh, the game plan program. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, this is, uh, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's, 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 um, honestly, it's, it's good being here. Thank you for the invitation, everyone. I appreciate it. And all due respect to our wonderful dignitaries here. Um, the foundation itself uh, started almost 30 years ago here in our wonderful s Southern California. And the idea is what I saw that came up here with our young lives. Uh, it's being able to have a vision, uh, have a passion, and being able to stand you know, stand for something as opposed to just existing. And that always inspires me when I see our young, young uh, boys and girls being able to stand up. Um, also what's so exciting for me is being able to, to continue doing leadership programs. And one of the programs we've been doing for these 27, 28, almost 28 years uh, is our, some of our summer basketball programs we do in school season, but more importantly, uh, we, we do it during the uh, off season. When I say off season, meaning summertime. But I want to say, first of all, um, as much as I love doing those kind of programs and we are enjoying them, uh, you can't do it by yourself. Uh, as you know, I've, I've been a part of some great teams. 
our wonderful Laker teams with the Shaq and Kobe era, with the Showtime, Magic and Kareem and James Worthy era. Yeah. But I, I definitely would say I'm, I'm a part of a new all-star team right here. Okay, this has been really exciting um, with these two gentlemen, Carlos and John, um, being here with me. Um, they are the ones that inspired me to think about Century High School and think about Santa Ana and think about where they went to school in their alma mater. They are alums and proud alums of the school. And at the same time, the Hispanic Orange County Chamber of Commerce, Carlos, has been just wonderful being a part and a member and I was introduced to it because of this young man right here and so it's been a happy family but it's, it's something that we're starting but it, we have so much ahead of us and so gentlemen I, I, this is not me so please come up here Both, right. John. let me bring this down a little bit <laughs> listen AC Green is a very humble guy as you guys can tell um, AC Green and I met at a gym a couple years ago Believe it or not, playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, we sat after playing about 10 games. I mean, this guy's in great shape. That's why they call him the Iron Man. And we sat down talking about what we were going to do in the community as, as friends. And he started helping my Life and Hope uh, Cancer Foundation immediately by being part of our golf tournament, our first ever fundraiser. And he came out, and they brought a bunch of cool stuff from the Lakers. And he helped us raise close to $50,000 for our first ever golf tournament. And so that was the beginning of many relationships and events in Orange County. And so one of the things he doesn't tell you is that he's been helping this. Santa Ana Boys Club for many years through toy drives and many things that he does there in Santa Ana. I'm actually a Santa Ana Boys and Girls Club kid right here on Highland Street. I grew up on Highland and Flower. I went to Lowell, Lathrop, and then Century. And so when AC... <laughs> that's right. That's right. When AC said to me, hey, let's start planning something in Santa Ana, uh, what do you think we should do as far as a camp? He was already doing these camps in other places. He didn't need to do it in Santa Ana, but he chose to give back to Santa Ana. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank AC for reaching out to, to our Santa Ana community and saying, let's do this. And so it was amazing. Our camp had, I think, close to 170 kids. Right, AC? 170 kids attended um, the AC Green Leadership Camp here at Century High School. And not only that, but we had tons of volunteers from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, from Luis and his organization, and, and many different people that volunteered in the community, um, our OC Hospice Company. And so we came together, and we had tons of people that helped out. And so one thing people don't realize is his camp was completely a free camp for kids for three days, free camp. Most of these camps can cost hundreds of dollars. And he brought his team together, we brought sponsors and donors, and we had Chick-fil-A one day for the kids, the other day we had Carl's Jr., and then the next day we put some money together and did Costco pizza for the kids, right? It's a lot of kids to feed, right? And so um, at the end of the whole camp, I didn't know this, but AC Green and his whole team bring out uh, back-to-school backpacks for the kids. Every child got a back-to-school backpack. Isn't that pretty cool? Thank you, AC. So, there, so he's doing some amazing things in the community. I want to thank him on behalf of Century High School, my alumni, Santa Boys Club, um, and of course, Carlos with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if you have a few words. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Tony. I'm in the middle, so AC was here, Johnny's here, I'm right here. Um, first of all, last year we played at a basketball game with Michelle Martinez's team against uh, Vince's team, and we lost. So I recruited this time Michelle, so uh, we, we got our new center for our basketball team, Michelle, <clears throat> for our basketball team, AC Green here, you know, so... There you go. You know, I only get the good people on my team, so go, AC, right. you're welcome. Yeah, so. No, but I, I do want to thank AC for coming out here, and uh, also Johnny for introducing AC to the chamber. And um, when AC asked me, you know, I'm looking to do this camp, and it's not just about basketball, football, or baseball, but also they teach uh, financial literacy as well as leadership, you know, and, and that's very important in, the, in a city like this, because that's what helped me uh, 
you know, do good things in a city like in Santana because I grew up here as well. I went to Century High School, late throw up all those good schools, you know. And I would have gone to all the colleges here, but I, they ran out of colleges, so, you know. I had to go to Cal State Fullerton eventually and get a degree. But uh, when AC asked me, I said, you got to come to Century. You know, why Century? Because luckily they had just gotten their new football field and their gym is phenomenal and all that good stuff. And those of you who do not know, Century High School, our first year, which was the year that I was there. I'm not going to tell you what day, 1992. But... Um, <laughs> Michael Cooper, who was a uh, teammate of uh, AC Green, actually opened up the school with us, so that was pretty cool, having AC Green coming back. But most important is seeing the kids that day looking at him, and like, we know he's a basketball player. You know, it's not LeBron, it's not Curry, but, you know, I'm like, you guys don't get this. This is uh, AC Green, but, you know, very humble man. He's, he's a great partner of the chamber, and we're glad to have him around with us. And we're just looking forward to do more events with him. And, you know, out of that, we got uh, Anthony here with uh, DMI, who's looking to partner up with the uh, AC Green Foundation and help at the next event. So uh, we just want to bring the bi business aspect to it to really come in and help our kids here in Santana. So thank you guys very much. Real quick, just real quick. For the kids that are here today, next year, let your friends know. It's acgreenfoundation.com, right, AC Green? acgreenfoundation.com, acgreen.com. Write that down, tell your friends about it. Next year, we're going to have the camp again at Century. We want more and more kids to be a part of it, so acgreen.com. Council Member Sarmiento. Look, we'll adjust it down one more time. Um, <laughs> look, what I, uh, you know... I was telling AC when I sat down with him and we took a selfie, I told him he's one of the reasons why I got through college, right? Because in the 80s, when I was struggling those dog days of college, these guys were running the courts and it was showtime, right? It was with Kareem, it was with Magic, it was with Worthy, it was with Cooper, it was with Byron, all these guys that maybe you guys don't remember because now we've got Kobe and LeBron and the whole thing. But back then, he was the one that did all the hard work. And it goes to his work ethic, it goes to his faith and his um, spirituality. So I really want to thank Carlos and John and, and, and Councilman Villegas because they've identified another champion for Santa Ana. AC, thank you. Keep up the hard work. You got some, you got some recruits here that want to play some ball with you, all right? So, so thank you, guys. And let's give them a big Santa Ana welcome, and thank you. And with that being said, uh, on behalf of the city of Santa Ana, we have a proclamation for you. Uh, and I will just get down to the, uh, the uh, last portion. Right. Therefore, we, the mayor and the city council of Santa Ana, do hereby acknowledge and recognize A.C. Green Youth Foundation and commend him on his excellent work with youth impacting tomorrow's leaders. Sir, thank you very much. I also have two more certificates, <laughs> one for Mr. Carlos Munoz and uh, Johnny Gutierrez, here you go, sir, for your excellent work. Thank you very much. We have the uh, last presentation. Can I have Mr. Edgar Vasquez, a Santa Ana resident, please come forward. And if you want to bring your, your parents, that would be great. Almain Jesus Vasquez. Si nos gustan acompañar, pueden pasar al frente, por favor.
and the uh, OCFA also. So on uh, May 13th, some of you might recall that there was a very uh, bad uh, vehicle accident on Fairview. Uh, a vehicle was traveling southbound on Fairview Avenue. Suddenly the vehicle uh, veered off the road and landed upside down in a drain storm and it quickly caught on fire with a couple of people trapped in it. And Edgar, if you can come up here, sir. Uh, you heard the noise, right? Yeah. He heard the noise, and if you could tell us a little bit about what happened that evening, it would be great, because uh, we would uh, like to hear that story. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> um, my car flipped over, they went into the drain, and I, it was about 2, 2.30 in the morning. Um, you could still hear the tires screeching, and um, they left their foot on the pedal, so... You just keep hearing the noise, and it wasn't something that normally happens since there's a lot of accidents in that area. Um, so I went outside, and I saw the car on fire. So I had to jump over the fence and break the glass window and help the guys that are in there out. Thank you, Thank you Edgar. Uh, Chief Black, if you want to come up and, and say a few words we, on, on behalf of the fire authority. Um, yeah, th thank you, Councilman. And uh, I think Councilman Sarmiento uh, said it just a few minutes ago. We got a lot of heroes in the room for a lot of different reasons this evening, and it's uh, great that the council is recognizing them. In this case, we have a, a citizen who just happened to hear a car crash. And uh, that can happen on any given day, and we drive right on by, call the fire department, and wait for us to get there. Um, and we're paid and trained how to res respond to those emergencies, but Edgar is just an average hero citizen out there who saw two people in a burning car, ran down the side of the uh, riverbed, and rescued one of those people out of the car. And uh, we were arriving, extinguished the fire, and transported that person as a trauma patient to the local hospital. So uh, we don't consider ourselves heroes as firefighters. It's our job. We're trained and we're equipped. Um, people like Edgar are our heroes. People like we've recognized this evening that stand up for a cause are our heroes. And uh, we just appreciate the council taking a few minutes to recognize Edgar, who did an amazing thing that night at 2.30 in the morning, who put himself out there jumping over that fence and running down into that riverbed. And uh, thank you, Edgar, on behalf of those folks that you rescued and on behalf of the Orange County Fire Authority. Thank you very much. Edgar Vasquez, uh, in recognition for your heroic act, saving the individual from the burning car, we want to present you this certificate of a recognition for your heroism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam uh, City Attorney, do we have anything to report out of closed session? Mayor, we do have um, rep one reportable action item, and it has to do with um, the acquisition of property um, on Bristol. And this is a real property business and goodwill settlement approved by the council with a four to one vote, with um, Mayor Pro Tem voting no, um, Mayor um, absent. Um, trying to remember the other absent. It was an approval for $1,882,500 for a complete settlement of that acquisition property. 
All right. With that said, let me. Um, I understand we have very few speakers. Um, let me take them, and uh, at the request of a council member here, I want to. Yeah. Or, or what do we have? Let me just see what we have, and we'll go from there. Okay. Consent calendar. Oh, these are business. Okay, let's do the consent. Got it. Got it. All right, so let's go to the consent calendar then for a moment. And um, all right, uh, Alexis Teodoro, let's uh, let's start there. And uh, Jairo Cortez and Victor Payan, please come on down. <coughs> Uh, good evening, Council. Um, um, my comment is just a public comment on a non-agendized item, but this week nationally in this country is called the National Renter Rights Week of Action, where not just in the city of Santa Ana, but all over the country, residents, black, Latino, poor folks, uh, folks that have to struggle to pay their rent every month are doing actions to show their cities that we need to pass measures like rent control, just cause eviction policies and create tenant rights. In Santa Ana, we have the great opportunity to be leaders in the county by creating local tenant rights because they don't exist. And actually, I'm here in support of all the residents, uh, my parents, my own family. I'm also a tenant here uh, and uh, so that we can, uh, I, I would encourage the city to encourage staff to move forward to do research in these issues so that we come, we can together create public policy, the way we did the sanctuary, the way we did the Santa Ana Justice Fund, the way we're going to continue to work together. Because from this moment on, we should be working together and combine our leadership to create tenant rights and the legal infrastructure to protect the rights of all of us in the city. Thank you. And I encourage you to direct staff to do research on such policy so that we can work together with such staff. Thank you. Thank you, you Alexis. Jairo Cortez. Jairo Cortez. Victor Payan. Followed by Marcela Rosas. All right, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, or our new um, uh, City Manager, I want to let you guys know uh, that our OC Film Fiesta is coming for its eighth year, and we've got the the best film fiesta yet. And again, want to thank the the city for their support in our early years. Um, passing around some highlights we have. We're opening October 6th at the main place, a uh, picture show with a documentary on Chavela Vargas, um, who's a LGBTQ uh, um, uh, singer from Mexico, very legendary and uh, um, champion of ranchera music, uh, who's a uh, Mexican from Costa Rica. So she has a famous saying about, about being a Mexican. Costa Rica. But anyways, um, we're having screenings uh, all over the city. We're working with the Musicians Association down on South Main. We're doing a, a full day of screenings there. We have a writer from Saturday Night Live who is the uh, writer of Will Ferrell's Spanish language movie, Casa de Mi Padre. We're showing his new uh, film there. And we're showing the Blues Brothers and uh, Greetings from Tim Buckley, uh, a film about a singer-songwriter who's from Orange County. Um, we're also doing a screening of The Magnificent Ambersons, a free screening of an Orson Welles classic at the Heritage Museum. Museum. We're showing A Day Without a Mexican, uh, the original short with Yareli Arismendi and Sergio Arau. We're bringing back uh, another film from Bolivian master Jorge San Ginés about uh, Juana Azurdui, who was a uh, leader in Bolivar's army who united the indigenous um, communities to fight against the Spanish. And uh, historians agree that if, um, if the indigenous communities didn't uh, participate in the, in, the, in the independence, they would have lost. The, so uh, we're also doing a tribute to uh, the artist Magu at Santa Ana College, uh, which is part of, um, in conjunction with UCI's exhibit uh, uh, from Aslan to Magulandia, uh, which is part of the Getty's uh, Pacific Standard Time exhibit. We're doing screenings on the side of a taco truck. And also um, we have an, a, a documentary here. It's a OC premiere of a documentary called The Rise and Fall of, Bra of the Brown Buffalo, who is Oscar Seta Costa. I don't know if you know the movie or the book, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter S. Thompson, very famous, played by Benicio Del Toro in the movie, who's a producer of this film. We're having the film, a documentary of a Chicano journalist and lawyer um, from the 60s who represented some of the folks from the moratorium. And uh, we're, we have the director, uh, Philip Gar uh, Rodriguez, coming for that. We're very excited. And one thing that we're also Thank excited you. about is... Uh, Please wrap up. Wrapping up, the last most important thing is that... Um, 
We're offering half price tickets to Santa Ana residents, students, teachers, and veterans and military. Thank you. So, thank, thank you for all the work you do, Victor. Thank you. Uh, let me call Octavio Salgado. And then after that, I need a translator for Marcela Rosas and Arceli Robles. So uh, if we can get our translator down. Meanwhile, is Octavo Salgado here? If not, Luis Sarmiento, I know you're here. Come on down, Luis. And I need the translator, whoever's translating this evening. Go ahead, Luis. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council persons, uh, staff. Um, I'm also here, part of the uh, National Renters Rights Week mobilization. A lot of organizations here in Santana are joining this uh, national mobilization and coming together with our renter community uh, because we feel like it's an opportunity to bring forward a lot of the policy solutions that we have been discussing uh, with several of you um, for the last several years. Not just the uh, protections for renters, but also um, solutions around economic development like the Community Land Trust, which is uh, a project that I have gotten involved in and a lot of our organizations um, have done a lot of research together with staff um, and we're hoping that we can continue the conversations the, around some of these policy solutions. We know that there's very big needs for uh, more affordable housing in Santana for lower income folks. Uh, we know that there's uh, a need for creative solutions to the homelessness uh, crisis and for the housing crisis here in Santana. We also know that there's creative solutions needed uh, for creating greater economic development that's inclusive of the immigrant community, that's inclusive of lower income folks who are, are full of initiative, full of energy and full of ideas. And there's a lot of people around, uh, around town who are willing to invest in these things. And so we're asking the city to get behind these ideas and get uh, together with our community groups to create these solutions for more inclusive economic development, which will allow us to remain in Santana and to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Marcela Rosas, Fabar Arceli Robles. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Araceli Robles y estamos aquí apoyando la Semana de, de Nacional del Derecho de los Inquilinos. Hemos tenido diferentes acciones ayer y hoy y vamos a continuar esta semana participando para que hacer más público la necesidad de vivienda que tenemos actualmente, no, no nada más en la ciudad de Santana, sino todo el país, ¿verdad? Y ahorita es un momento muy bueno que tenemos nosotros, cuando tenemos tantos lotes disponibles que se pueden ser usados para vivienda, para las personas, porque nosotros deseamos permanecer y prosperar en Santana, no deseamos irnos para otro lugar, queremos seguir enriqueciendo la ciudad de Santana, porque es muy triste, a mí hace un año me desalojaron y mi nieta tiene tres años. Y siempre que pasamos por donde vivía antes me decía, nana, les gojón, vámonos a casa. La casa que ella conoció es de donde nos desalojaron y yo siento que ningún niño debe de, debe de pasar por ese trauma, porque es un trauma que se les queda a los niños por no tener una vivienda digna. Por eso yo los invito realmente a seguir trabajando juntos como lo hemos hecho anteriormente y que realmente apoyen este, esta nueva campaña que tenemos nosotros para beneficio de nosotros. Ahorita la ciudad de Santana está siendo muy visible, no nada más en, en el condado, sino a nivel país, porque están surgiendo muchos movimientos como cooperativas y más este, movimientos comunitarios. Entonces tenemos que trabajar juntos y, que, y personalmente yo... Quiero tener una vivienda donde pueda vivir dignamente como toda la comunidad se merece. Gracias y buenas noches. Good evening, my name is Araceli Robles, and I'm uh, here for the uh, Renters Week, uh, Renters Rights Week, and uh, I've lived across different uh, areas, and we have to thank you for your support. We need more public housing. Uh, we need public housing in here, and there are lots of lots that can be used uh, for housing here in Santa Ana. Uh, I like to remain here in this in this city, not go somewhere else, uh, because I like to continue enriching the city of Santa Ana. I was evicted. Uh, 
uh, some time ago, and my three-year-old granddaughter, whenever we go by the house, she says, uh, Nana, let's go home, let's go back home. It's a trauma for the kids to be, uh, to be evicted and to lose their house, uh, to not have dignified housing. So we're working, we'd like to, to work with us in this campaign for renters' rights in, in Santa Ana. This, uh, Santa Ana is getting more visible, not only in the county, but in the entire country, because of all the cooperatives and all the work that we've been doing. So I'd like to have dignified housing for myself and my family. Thank you. Now, um, Marcela Rosas. Se fue Esperanza Vielma. And Esperanza, I may note you're here for a speak on Restore the Delta, and you're all the way down from Stockton, California, so welcome. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak, um, Mayor and Council Members. Again, yes, I'm from Stockton, California with Restore the Delta. Um, the Delta is the largest, most unique estuary on the Pacific Coast and is home to over 4 million people. I'm one of those 4 million people. And um, I'm the Environmental Justice Director for Restore the Delta. And a week ago, and so we want to inform you and let you know that there's different um, things that are happening on a daily basis and changing with the California water fix. And um, obviously the residents have a lot of issues as far as costs are concerned. And this is one of the costs that are going to affect the residents, your constituents, as far as rate pays, increase with water, property tax, federal tax, and state tax. Today, Westland's Water District voted no in terms of supporting the California water fix, and they're part of the monetary piece of the $64 billion twin tunnels. So we would like the opportunity to inform some of your residents, your constituents. We've made um, various presentations at the cities of Hawaiian Gardens, Beverly Hills, Pasadena, different cities throughout Southern California with some of our colleagues here. Um, there are some folks today at other various city council meetings. And we're asking for the opportunity to provide information to you, the city council members, as well as your um, residents. In some places, like in Boyle Heights, we did community meetings um, in Weezar's district there. And so we're asking if you all would like um, a presentation, a formal presentation. We will be here um, almost every week and we're meeting with various, like I said, city council and we've made various presentations um, and we would like to see if you all would like that in terms of um, having that sometime in the near future for your residents and for yourselves. Thank you for your, for your presentation, you. Councilmember Vince Sarmiento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, for coming and addressing us. Uh, uh, our Mayor Pro Tem sits on the Metropolitan Water District, and I yes. sit on the Orange County Water District. Might not be a bad idea to maybe have us speak offline okay. and talk about maybe doing something for the residents. I think, um, uh, Madam City Manager, we've adopted something in resolution form. But again, I think it's not a bad idea for us to look at the numbers, the impact, and how it's going to um, uh, affect our rates to our rate payers. Cause it, you know, we really do have sensitive rate payers. Any adjustment in those fees, right. and if they're drastic, it becomes even more difficult. But, you know, something that at least they should become more informed about. So we'd love to maybe work with you. Yeah, most definitely. We, by the way, today we're at the subcommittee meeting at the City of Los Angeles with various other folks, and they also moved to set it off. They're not moving it forward with the City of Los Angeles because of the same thing, that they, they're um, the councilwoman who, Nuri Martinez, who is the chair of that committee, the environmental committee, they put it off for... Um, in terms of further financial review, they um, directed staff with like various eight points on the financial specifically. So you are correct, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I do sit on the Metropolitan Water District, and we have yet to take up the actual vote on this specific issue. And so definitely would love to speak with you, but I just want to make it very clear that the Metropolitan Water District has yet to take, the board members have yes. yet to take a position. So I just want to just state that for the record. We have yet to take a position. Okay. Or, or, or vote, excuse me. Yeah, no, we've been like working with the cities. Any other Thank questions? you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Carl, manager. Good evening, Council and, and, and mayors. Uh, on October 16th is going to be the deadline for applying for funds from SB1. 
And SB1 is the tax dollars that are going to be collected from, from our uh, gasoline tax, 10 cents increase. And as I've been trying to ask through ETEC and what have you, what projects are we submitting? And I, get, I don't get a warm feeling that we are. So I'm really asking for your support because a lot of our tax dollars are going to be collected. And I'd sure like to see Santa and Anna get their fair share of that, of that project. Now, I also understand Public Works' concern. They've turned a number of products, projects in, anything with matching funds have not been approved. And these projects require matching funds. I also understand their problem, too, because they're short of manpower. And it seems we have talked about this repeatedly over the last number of months, and it seems like it's not getting any, any better in public works. So whatever you can do to help public works increase their manpower so we can take advantage of these projects and get other items, items done. For example, I have a tree stump in my neighborhood. It's been there since February. And the word that I get is we don't have the manpower to take it out yet. We're asked for a survey in our neighborhood for speed bumps six to eight months before they can do the review or the engineering to do this. And this, people are getting this with public also. So they do end up needing help. And lastly, I can't think of a better project than the watering trees, which I've talked about here, that would free up six people out of public works to go do other, other items. So please don't forget about the trees. Approve the $275,000 that we asked for, for watering trees, and that will free up six men in public works to go do other things. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem yes, Martinez. Uh, Mr. Mayor, very briefly, we mentioned this yesterday, Carl, in our um, committee, um, council committee meeting, which I chair. And, you know, the, the process is that um, the city staff is going to have to come back, come to this dais with a resolution of supporting SB1 projects. So, this, so it has to come to the public for us to approve. And certainly there is a list of projects that have been presented to this council um, through our interim city manager and our public works director. And so they will be finalized and coming to us sometime in October I asked before it comes to the uh, to the council for a vote that it um, be provided to the council in, 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 in a week or so so that we can take a look because we may have difference of opinion in regards to projects and what we don't want at the 11th hour is to not support certain projects and not be able to go after the funding that we deserve based on the taxes um, that we pay for gasoline and so thank you so very much for for bringing this up but we're on it and so um, I appreciate it thank you uh, and with that what I'd like to do is let's take item 11 B it's one I previously abstained on so you take it and then I'll be right back great thank you uh, mayor and madam mayor pro tem can I just say something the, uh, oh, yes, as, as we move into the consent um, to those folks who came up to talk about you know uh, tenants rights week and renters rights week um, I wanted to address this to the to madam city manager um, I think there's, this is a good public policy area where we can do a work study just to research. You know, when I started looking at the numbers of how many renters and tenants we have in the city, it's a huge, huge number. So we have less and less owner-occupied uh, single-family homes and multifamily homes. And so the, the conditions that um, our renters and our tenants live in is, um, is even more acute here in the city. So you know, things that impact them, um, you know, increasing rents, um, conditions that are below our substandard, um, you know, evictions that are unwarranted, all those things I think impact our community. And I think what we, you know, I have a lot of hope that the bills before the governor for um, affordable housing funds are going to be successful. And I hope that's, that's going to provide some relief. So that's one element that we increase the stock in the inventory of affordable housing but that's just one um, one issue the other issue is we have a lot of absentee landlords a lot of slum lords unfortunately here in the city that abuse our um, families and our residents and they lead to other consequences um, we have parking issues because families now have to double and triple up in units because they can't afford these in these uh, increased rents and what we see is that some of these rents are so high they're higher than mortgages right so then mortgage payments so I think what we can do is try to find a way where we can uh, find a path for some of these folks to become homeowners there's no better way than to um, improve the condition of our city and the quality of life is to make folks own their own home and if we can find that path for folks that um, 
may qualify because they're already paying very elevated rents. If they could purchase their home, there's a certain pride and ownership that just creates a much better neighborhood and better living conditions for our uh, children and families. So all those things I think we can do, um, you know, and maybe there's a way that these, um, you know, just looking at the conditions, maybe there's a way we can pass through those, um, those costs on to those bad actors that we find are violating um, you know, uh, uh, conditions. And so I just want us to look at this as an area and maybe what we do is we come back to the council with the work study on just what the condition is of our folks who rent and our tenants, right? And um, see if we can put some teeth in some, into some of the things that uh, we have on the books already, but um, just be a little bit more assertive on the issue. So I just thought that's something that we can add to our many list of things that we need to tackle. So thank, thank you. you, Councilman Sarmiento. And I, I, I can't take any more comments, not on the agenda. And so want to make sure that uh, we're not in violation of the Brown Act. So I'm going to move forward with 11 uh, B, which is the second reading of the ordinance to adopt an ordinance to regulate mobile food vending. And we do have four speakers before we bring it up to this dais. The first one is Federico Sire. Fred. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. I know all of you except for Councilman Viegas. I uh, represent Los Vendedores. They are the sellers of produce that uh, ply their trade by trucks on the corners. And I'm here to speak against the adoption of the mobile food vending vehicle ordinance as presently constituted because I believe that it is unconstitutional and it will receive a lawsuit and an attempt at a temporary restraining order. We began this 11 years ago when a prior uh, city council passed a mean-spirited and unconstitutional ordinance which, if it had been enforced, would have had the effect of defeating or destroying the ability of Mexican truck owners to, pl uh, to ply their trade in the city of Santa Ana, both as vendedores and as loncheros, the people who prepare food and sell it to the public. I was able to obtain an injunction at that time in the Federal District of Court against the enforcement of that, and it's, that injunction remain in, has remained in effect for 11 years. This year, this city council has attempted to now bring about a new ordinance which remains unconstitutional. There are four aspects of this ordinance that I believe are still unconstitutional. 250 feet around a school in all directions, uh, you're prohibited from being able to conduct your trade. The reason for this is it's supposed to prevent children from running across the street, and I understand the safety issues, but when it's in enforced, all the way around the school, the only effect it has, where the children are not, is to prevent people from being able to ply their trade where they've been doing it for 20 years or more. Um, there is also a provision that says you cannot do your business on a street that is 35 miles per hour or more. Even the first ordinance said more than 35 miles per hour, and I don't believe there's been any showing of what is so unreasonable about being able to do your business on a 35 mile per hour street. In the 11 years, I have seen no statistics that have shown there's been an increase in, in something that's unsafe. The 50, mile, 50 feet from the uh, end of the intersection, not being able to park, it's the only truck, type of trucks that are prohibited. Mr. Sarah, if you could please conclude. I will. And Basically, it's a 14th Amendment issue, lack of equal protection. And finally, those loncheros cannot have electrical signs on top of their trucks, which is a violation of their First Amendment rights. And it's also something inconsistent with the fact that the stores they're in front of have even much larger signs. So for all those reasons, it is unconstitutional as presently constituted. I ask you to vote it down or to send it back for restudy and renegotiation. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sayer. Followed by Alex Oriano. Alex. Buenas noches a los miembros del Concilio. Este, nos estamos, este, yo creo que en esta, en este trabajo de que está haciendo para llevar este, este nuevo proyecto de ley que está formando la ciudad, este, estamos más cerca de llegar a un acuerdo que en otras ocasiones anteriores. Lo único que falta es un poco más de entendimiento en ciertos puntos, como el de millas, realmente no estamos pidiendo las millas porque... 
queremos este, estar a gusto nosotros, sino realmente esto es una necesidad para seguir trabajando, porque entre más calles se reduzcan en la ciudad de Santana, más aglomeramiento va a haber en ciertas áreas para trocas. Y entonces entre más áreas tengamos despejadas, más opciones tenemos para seguir trabajando. Entonces es una de las razones, por eso pedimos que si se pueden hacer ciertos cambios para seguir manteniendo más áreas amplias para seguir trabajando. Y claro, también cuidando la seguridad, que es lo que quiere mantener también la ciudad de Santana. Gracias. Gracias. Next is Anacito, followed by Victor Payan. Uh, good evening. Thanks uh, for doing this work with the ordinance. And uh, I think we are getting closer to an agreement than we have in, in, in the past. And we need to get to a closer understanding, for example, the miles uh, per hour, uh, because I, I know this is a, a, a safety issue. And uh, we, the, if we reduce the areas where we can have the trucks, we have more, air, more trucks in other areas will be more congested. And so we need to make these uh, certain changes. And I know this is a, a, a safety issue and that's important for the city. Ancito um, Sanchez, followed by Victor Payan, Irma Macias. Um, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Aniceto Mejía y pues uh, yo nomás quisiera decir unas pocas palabras. Pues yo sería uno de los afectados porque yo estoy allá afuera Yo soy uno de los loncheros y claramente que yo sería uno de los afectados y pues no solamente es una persona, es una troca, somos muchos y una troca pues claramente que pues alimenta a muchas personas. Entonces claramente que pues de todas las ordenanzas que han puesto pues muchos se han beneficiado y otros se han perjudicado y pues claramente que pues muchos no están aquí, nomás estamos poquitos y yo soy uno de ellos. Uh, yo quisiera que verdaderamente estudiaran la que está perjudicándonos, que es la de 35, porque corre 35, pero pues claramente que uh, donde estoy yo nunca ha pasado un accidente, o so, claramente que no es una calle angosta. Es una calle muy ancha y pues cuando empezamos un negocio pues claramente que lo podemos nosotros escogemos dónde ponernos, dónde iniciarlo y nosotros hemos escogido la ciudad de Santana para hacer negocio y no es que yo haya uh, no es que muchos hayamos tenido el permiso ayer. Estamos aquí porque estamos defendiendo, pues, lo que ya hemos hecho. Yo en sí tengo cinco años allí, pues, si me llegan a mover, pues, entonces, pues, no solamente es una persona, una troquita, es una familia y es pues, un vecindario que claramente que ya está acostumbrado a, a lo que es la comida. Entonces, pues, en sí, a mí sí me afectaría mucho. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señor Sánchez. Uh, good evening, I'm Seto Mejia. I'm uh, here to uh, just say to say a few words. I am one of the people being affected because I am a, 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 a truck uh, provider. And it's not just one person when we talk about a truck. This truck feeds many, many people. And of all the ordinances uh, that we've passed, in, uh, that approved in, in the past, uh, many people benefit and many people are damaged by it or hurt by it. Um, and I'm here, not a lot of people are here tonight, but I'm, I'm here and I'm being affected by it. And I'd like you to study the issues, especially the 35 mile per hour issue. I know it's 35, um, but where I've been for many, many years, there have not been any accidents. It's a very broad street, so it's, it's safe. Uh, when you start a business, we choose where we, we can start our business. So we chose Santa Ana to do our business in. And it's not like I got my permit yesterday. I've been doing this for many years. Uh, we're here to defend uh, what we've uh, worked for so, for so many years. I've been here for five years. And my, this feeds not only myself, it feeds my family. And many, the neighbors around me are used to the food that we provide. So we are here to, uh, to support this. Great. Uh, Victor Payan, followed by Irma Macias. Victor, Irma.
All right, I just want to say that uh, I love food trucks. I like driving by food trucks. They're very, um, they create a sense of vibrancy. And I think um, in Santa Ana, we see a supply and we see a demand. And I think some of the, the problems that may be created in the community is maybe just a question of distribution and not of so, so much enforcement. If the, if the trucks are on the, on the streets, perhaps we can move them into parking lots that are empty at night. I know that when I used to drive my, uh, my bicycle around, uh, ride my bicycle around French Park, I would see a lot of kids playing soccer in these empty parking lots. If we put a food truck in there and activate the spaces creatively with cultural activities, we can activate the different communities, make them safer. Obviously people are coming to these food trucks because they, they serve a need, and a lot of that is a need for community, um, for regional, um, you know, uh, people coming together and talking in neighborhoods and communities. If we create a safe place for, for those to happen, maybe we do cultural events with food trucks in, in the parks where they already have restrooms, or in uh, near the schools, for example. I know it's not, uh, you know, the idea is not to have them sell food during the day, but perhaps in the evening after school, we we can create zones where you know you encourage the commerce. There's more regulation, uh, but also there's an opportunity for people to um, to get together, convene, maybe have some entertainment. But also, you know, I see business people who want to contribute to the city. So maybe finding a way to, as we've said with the arts in general, because the food trucks represent the culinary arts, of of creating licensing, you know, business licenses that that, that are, they're adaptable to their uses. And perhaps, like I said, with distribution, finding a way to equitably distribute the food trucks throughout the city so that areas that are not served by restaurants or places where they can get healthy food at night actually now have um, some service to them. Um, and also in San Antonio and Tucson, they do cultural events around food trucks. They do like a food truck rodeo roundup. And, and, and I think that we could do something like that here in Santa Ana. We, as I said, with the film festival, we're looking to do uh, taco truck cinema to do screenings on the sides of taco trucks. And we're looking for spaces when we, um, to do a series. When we were up in the Americans for the Arts conference in San Francisco, and we were talking to the San Francisco city planners, they envied Santa Ana because they said, we have all these ideas, but we don't have any space. Santa Ana Anna has space, Victor, especially please, industrial um, space. It's turned red. If you could please. Yes, yeah, so that's all I wanted to Great. say. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Irma Macias. Good evening, Council, um, Mr. Attorney, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Irma Macias, and I uh, have been resident for the past, uh, I'm going to say, over 45 years in Santa Ana. And I have seen the two in these neighborhoods. Um, we have a lot of uh, difference in, in our community, and I'm here in support of the new ordinance for the food and vendor trucks, and I have reasons for that. Those trucks are not in the whole city. This city is not divided in equal parts. There are some neighborhoods that are targeted by these individuals. There are, I get stressed with this, because I'm passionate about this. Every single meeting that we attend, we have issues with the community explaining them why there is no parking, why there are four or five trucks in one block, and why are they targeting the poorest community. I think that um, it needs to be a reason. There is no demand. I don't believe in that. And as I see these individuals coming and say, this is my business, well, what happened to the moms and pop shops where they have to spend thousands of dollars investing in insurance, uh, licenses, the uh, county, everywhere that they have to go through, jump on loops just to get their businesses running. Businesses are coming to the city and you need to support them. It's a must because the city revenue comes from those places. I don't believe that the licenses that these individuals have they had broke so many ordinances. They had the chance to fix it. You see those lights? Aren't the uh, ordinance before that? We have laws, but we, it doesn't mean anything if you don't implement it. And for years, we have suffered these individuals. In neighborhoods where the gangs are infested, those trucks are with no health inspections because the county I think it has maybe one or two individuals that they don't come if, you, they're, if they're not called. Irma, can you please conclude? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much. I'm here to support this ordinance 
and implemented to the fullest. We need the court enforcement in every entity in this department. Thank, Thank you, you so, so very much. much. Um, there is no more uh, comment on this item. I'm going to bring this back to the dais uh, uh, for us to deliberate. Are we considering the consent calendar as a whole? Um, no, we only consider this item. The mayor will come okay. back uh, for the rest I of the I move the item. Consent. Second. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor, please indicate by, unless there's comment. I, I, I did just have a question yes. with regard to an, uh, speed limit that was referenced and the, and the, uh, the uh, requirement there, the prohibition of, of trucks within streets that are, as I understand it, uh, up 35 miles and above. How, the, the rationale behind that and uh, can you speak to that, Madam City Attorney, or staff? Um, Councilman, Councilmember Benavides, I'll, I'll get started and then we may need staff um, as the assistants. And if the council will just indulge me quickly, since we do have an attorney on record and threatening litigation, I'd just like to state that um, on each of the items with respect, just to get it onto the record, with respect to the 250 feet um, from the school, we discussed that at length at our last meeting. You may recall that it is not a full circle around the school. You may recall that you asked questions about that, so that issue was addressed. Um, with respect to the um, uh, 50 feet from an intersection and with respect to the, the miles per hour, the 35 mile per hour streets, both of these came as recommendations from our staff based on a safety study that was prepared by the Public Works Department. Um, that safety study, that is the basis for it, that is the finding. And so I'd say that if you have questions about those findings, we probably should refer it to public um, works staff who prepared that report. But the city hired um, um, a, 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 an expert to come in and look at our streets as part of the safety um, review that we did, and that's where those numbers came up from. Uh, that's where we came up with these regulations. And then finally, with respect to the electrical signs on trucks, my understanding is from planning that these are the exact same regulations that apply to all other businesses in the city. Um, there are some laws that, that provide some exemptions for, for cars and trucks, but I think we were trying to be consistent and so that we were treating everybody the same. And that's where they came from. But re with respect to the 35 mile per hour, um, I think it was purely a safety issue. My understanding is that while you were doing a safety tour that Mayor Pro Tem Martinez was involved in, that she was on a street of 35 miles um, or more and literally s almost saw someone step into that street because the trucks are so large and the speed is, is you know, 10 miles um, faster than 25 can make a difference in terms of how quickly a car can stop. And that's the rationale for it and completely up to you as to whether you want to adopt the regulations or not. I, I see our... Um Somebody from our public works that's standing. Um, not sure if you want him to come up or not. Uh, if, if he Galvez. has anything additional uh, William, to uh, Mr. Galvez, I appreciate City Attorney's uh, If you have anything uh, further to add as it pertains to the study of speed and. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the City Council. Uh, the 35 mile an hour uh, limit uh, and above is because of the size of the vehicles. It interferes with some of the visibility. A as you know, some of the speeds, so some of the higher speeds in the, uh, on city streets are due to the, how wide they are, how wide the lanes are. And so, uh, so by having trucks there, they might interfere with visibility. They might also encourage uh, mid-block uh, uh, pedestrians uh, uh, crossing the street. And that really is impacting some of our safety uh, uh, issues that we're uh, experiencing in the city. It also came up in the uh, uh, Nelson Nygaard study. And so we're trying to narrow lanes, we're trying to reduce speeds, and so we felt that the size of the vehicles on 35 mile an hour speed limit or above is going to uh, impact that safety. Helpful to have the background. And, and finally, I just want to—I do want to add, just so the council is aware of this. Um, we have worked diligently and have had contacts with um, Mr. Sayre. And one of the things that we offered to him was, uh, if you can show us how many of these trucks of your clients will be impacted by the 35 mile per hour, demonstrate to us how many are out there and who they are. And my understanding is that the information we got back was not specific. For example, it was one of my clients named Maria. Her truck is on this street. What we were trying to do is do the analysis and find out whether this regulation was impacting 100 trucks or three. And the information we got back was not specific enough for us to follow up with the applicants or the truck owners. Thank you. Great. Councilman Tinajero, followed by Councilman Sarmiento. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. <coughs> uh, first and foremost, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, the uh, For the community to know, the previous council that 
created these ordinances against the loncheros or lunch trucks uh, had had some racial undertones to it. It was specifically to 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 make it as difficult as possible for them to operate. That when they went to court, it was evident by where people were sitting in that courtroom that the judge ruled that uh, the city was way out of compliance in here and they had, had basically created an overreach. What this council has attempted to do is something different. And uh, of course, not all plans are perfect, but in the spirit, the spirit of this particular ordinance was very different from that particular council. And that we went out and met with many of these uh, individuals that have these businesses and said, what is it that is going to hurt you? What is it that we're not seeing that we need to know about? How can we work together? How can we compromise? And we work through a lot of issues. As I stated before, at the end of the day, it's not always uh, perfect and it's not always going to meet every single person's needs because it's just that government uh, it just doesn't work that way. And one of the things that I've told people is, you know, when you, when you take a position up here, uh, you're going to have a segment that's not going to agree with you. But you have to look down into your purpose, uh, what you're really trying to do, know that you are trying to work out a solution that's beneficial for everyone. Because I do believe that these loncheros or lunch trucks or whatever we want to call them tonight, play a major role in our city's uh, uh, marketing value. I believe we have some great loncheros out there, great lunch trucks, vending trucks that are doing great work in attracting people to the city of Santa Ana. I know people who travel long, long, uh, long, a long ways to get here to go to certain uh, loncheros across our city. I think what Mr. Payan is saying is, is, is a great idea. We need to look for other ways to expand this, make it more of a community event through the films, through the arts, whatever we can do. But we needed to start somewhere. We needed to create some type of solvency. And I believe that many members here of our, in our dais have worked hard to try to do that. We were here a few weeks ago where this, 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 this place was jam-packed with business owners that operate here in our city. And when we voted to take this, move this forward, they cheered. We went out there, we took pictures together, we shook hands, we gave each other hugs because they felt there was victory that had just taken place. And so that is why tonight I think we need to move forward and I'm gonna be supporting this motion. Councilman Sarmiento. Thank you, Ma Madam Mayor Pro Tem. And I just wanted to take us back a, a little bit and thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem, because I believe it was your 85A that brought this before the council as an, as an issue item. and I. Um, and I know Councilman Tinajero has been very, very um, accessible and has done a lot of work meeting with the uh, vendors individually. And I want to thank, uh, you know, uh, Fred Sayer for not only making sure that that former um, attempt to regulate, um, you know, was, was, was not allowed and was enjoined, because that did, I think, again, as was mentioned, it was more mean-spirited than the one that, that is before us now. I think the difference between now and then is that we don't want to prohibit. We want to make sure that these lunch trucks thrive. I think, and they do it in a way that's not going to impact some of the you know, neighborhoods, not going to impact the businesses, and is going to continue to allow them to operate and, and, and have folks earn a living. I don't see it as a detriment to the community. I see it as a benefit when it's done well, right? And so it's balancing these interests. It's making sure that folks understand that um, we don't want you to be gone. We want you to just operate in a way that's going to create success for them and create a, a good quality of life for all our residents here as well. So I did see a lot of vendors um, uh, during our first reading, and I know that they were going to be impacted. They may have to adjust, but, th but they're still going to be allowed to do business here. Right? They're still going to be welcomed here. So I see this as one step to many others, which is to create islands for um, vending trucks. I know that you know, other communities have um, places where uh, vending trucks are there exclusively, and people are able to go there and have different kinds of, kinds of food. It's almost a, uh, a food commons. And so those things, I think, are assets, and there are things that, you know, we have creative people here in our community that um, love to cook good food. And so to the extent that we uh, find a way to... Um, you know, to capitalize on that and see that that's a benefit rather than a hindrance to us, I think it's a really good thing. So 
this isn't coming from a bad place. This is coming from a good place. We see these folks as part of our community and part of our um, part of our commerce that we do here. So I will be um, supportive, and I do appreciate, though, um, you know, all the effort that staff has done. I know that we've continued this. I don't know how many times, but um, you know, it's been ad nauseum. So, um, and I see Alvaro smiling back there, so he knows we've continued this several times. But thank you for all the hard work on behalf of. Um, Thank residents. you, Councilman Sarmiento. I'm going to go to our city attorney and then to Councilman Salorio. I'm so sorry. I just, you know what, um, city attorneys and speech and debate coaches love facts, and I wanted to say this. I forgot to say it. Um, you know, um, based on safe speed research, if someone's hit by a car at 20 miles per hour, they are 10% likely to be killed. If someone's hit by a car at 30 miles an hour, they're 50% likely to be killed. And if someone's hit by a car at 40 miles per hour, there's a 90% chance that they'll be killed. And we all know that when we drive on 35 mile per hour streets, we all tend to inch up a few a few um, miles per hour. And so I think that's, I wanted to leave that with the council. That is that is our primary reason for making this recommendation on 35 miles an hour. Thank you, Madam City Attorney, Councilman Solodio. Yeah, just a couple of brief things. I, I know we've uh, delayed this section numerous months. But there's been a, a lot of outreach, a lot of discussions. Uh, I, I do appreciate you know these new uh, items that came up, but there's been uh, plenty of time to have uh, these dialogues. I know the research that was provided to the city council was robust in terms of identifying the various safety and, and legal and uh, local community considerations for what was in the ordinance. Uh, also, I myself toured various of these sites, and I think uh, uh, the, the the type of uh, individual we've talked about today aren't really from the, the food trucks, they're really more the, the produce trucks, and uh, you know, the, the vast majority of those that I saw tend to be in more inner communities, uh, slower speeds, uh, so, so I think uh, they actually, compared to the food trucks, are going to be much less likely to be impacted by the uh, speed limit item than the others, so I did want to make that clarification as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I know we have a first and a second, um, but before um, you, we call for the vote, I wasn't here at the last meeting. I certainly um, supported the original um, ordinance that our city staff worked on. I know there were some amendments from um, this council on this dais, and so I just want to make it very clear that I do uh, support us moving up to code. I do support um, the safety rationale of why we're moving uh, towards this ordinance. What I don't support, and I just want to state for the record is that I don't support us going from 500 to 250 uh, feet in regards to schools because one we're jeopardizing um, you know the federal lunch program of our school district that's one um, and then the second thing is, is is the safety and the air quality near a school and I know that this council is going to work diligently and I've had conversations with the Senate pro tem de Leon as it pertains to, um, you know, some of the equipment uh, um, that's in their trucks um, that, you know, need to get up to, to, to par. And I've also spoken with, the, uh, uh, with other agencies to help these trucks, you know, get in compliance. But um, at, at the end of the day, you know, I can't for, 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 the, for, for the means of possibly our school district and not 89 to 90 percent of our students are in free and reduced lunch. And so I would never put our students or jeopardize them. Our superintendent sent a letter to this, uh, to the city as it pertains to the je us possibly jeopardizing if we were re to remove the 500 feet rule. And so for that reason, I cannot support that, but I do support the regulations and the code that we're moving forward. I just wanted to state for that for the record. So with all that being said, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor, you can please come on in. And as our mayor comes, I, he will be wrapping up uh, with the rest of the consent calendar. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So, Madam Clerk, uh, we have other speakers on the consent calendar. I have not received any other cards. All right. So with that, what items uh, do we want to pull, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, Mayor. I'd like to pull um, 11A. I'm just a no vote. Just um, I wasn't at the last meeting, All right. so I didn't have time to review 
um, and it's pretty detailed, so I'm going to vote no. I would like to pull 11B. We just did vote oh, on Oh, sorry. That. Yeah, we did that. Sorry. 25A. Okay. 25A, uh, F. And I am, uh, uh, for the record, a no on 25J, 25K, and 25L, and that all has to deal with Bristol. All right. So we'll just lump all those together. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to record a no on 19E as 19 an Edward. 19E. Okay, why don't we uh, go, let's um, start with 11A. I was just a no on that. Oh, you're just a no on that. Mm -hmm. So look, why don't we adopt a balance, and then I'll just come back to those few exceptions. I'll make a motion to approve on Second. the balance. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. So now let's uh, come to the items. Would that be 25 Yes, a? Mayor, and this is just a, a, a memorandum of understanding between the city of Garden Grove in regards to the Willowick Golf Course. I just want to say that, you know, I'm really excited that we're moving into this memorandum of understanding and wanting to thank the city of Garden Grove, in particular the, uh, the mayor, Mr. Steve, uh, uh, mayor Jones, for, you know, I know he had various conversations with various council members and, you know, um, the um, um, city manager Styles from Garden Grove had conversations with our staff, and I'm glad that this agree um, this MOU is finally so that we can continue to have these conversations and what kind of development that we want. And so I'm very supportive, Mayor. So I'll, I'll move the item. Is there a second? second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Um, next item was that F. That that is F, and I'm going to defer to Councilman Tirajano. I know he had um, wanted to pull that item as well, and. Um, so 25F is the uh, jail in the yeah, medical services. The uh, medical services. Uh, who, who from our staff can speak to that? Sort of depends on your question. Is it about the, the specifics the, of the service? or The, the question is, is more related to, um, I want to know what the process was. Oh, was for selecting this? Right. Chief, who could speak to the medical Yeah, I'd just like to know uh, what the bid process was. And how yeah, we did a, an RFP request for proposals, and we received uh, two proposals. We um, had uh, evaluation criteria consisting of responsiveness to the RFP, which was 20 percent, experience of firm and personnel, which was 40 percent, and the uh, evaluation criteria was weighted 40 percent towards cost. So what is it that put this firm above the other firm? It was primary, primarily the uh, experience of the firm. Uh, NAFCARE was the only respondent that has its own in-house uh, pharmacy service. In addition, um, they're our current uh, medical provider and they've significantly reduced the amount of inmate medical grievances over the past few years. And they've significantly reduced the need to transport inmates outside uh, to outside medical facilities because of, of their ability to treat medical, medical conditions on site. And that's resulted in a big cost savings to the city for overtime for our jail personnel, as well as um, you know, the big cost, uh, big time savings. The reason I ask is uh, this organization has had some serious issues. Um, I believe it was in Alabama. Uh, they had 13 deaths in their jails, and 10 out of the 13 were a result where NAP care was, or this organization was brought basically. Uh, lawsuits were brought up against them for negligence and so forth. Uh, there was one just recently in Tacoma uh, where an individual uh, died because of insufficient medical attention. Uh, there was another issue in Virginia. So my, I guess I understand cost savings. My only concern is did we vet that? Were those questions asked? How is it that they've come to a resolution to assure that that doesn't happen here at our facility. Well, one thing is we, we've had NAFCARE as the medical provider at the jail since, I believe, 2014. And the, they've done a really good job. Staff speaks highly of them. Again, they've uh, decreased our number of uh, uh, medical grievances at the jail. 
and they've uh, performed satisfactorily over the last few years. Do you have data that shows what the grievances were prior to 2014 and what they've been, how, how much they've decreased since then? Uh, yes, I don't have the specifics, but I know the jail personnel keeps track of that. Okay. I mean, I, it's just difficult to make an uh, informed decision without some of that data. I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, distrust uh, your observation and your management skills when it comes to what they're providing for us. It's just I, I don't know what it has what has happened at these other facilities um, that's different from our facilities. In other words, are there things that we are mitigating or are there certain things that we do that would prevent something like that from happening? Because these are other states, so I don't know what the regulations are in other states that don't have maybe some of the safety nets that we have here in the state of California. Correct. And perhaps our jail administrator, Chris Holland, might have some additional information related to those details. Good evening, Councilman Tenejero. Uh, we don't have uh, any issues or concerns with NAFCARE since they've been in our working with us. Um, I, we work very well with the HSA, who is the on-site administrator, and all grievances that come through are dealt with immediately. They are very responsive. We don't have any, there's no fight to have them respond or provide care for any of the individuals we have in custody. We have had one in custody death recently about, uh, I would say two months ago, I believe. And, but that was unrelated to their care or that they failed to provide anything. It was simply, um, you know, the, the individual did, did eventually pass away, but he was cared for up until the point that he was there. Um, there was nothing that they did that we've determined in any of the cases of our inmates um, that was due to lack of care on their part. And what is the, how, how long is the contract for? What is the amount? This particular agreement is for two years with the option to renew for an additional three years. Uh, when you say an option to renew, would it come back to the council to make that approval, or is that? Yes, uh, we, would, we would be coming back to council on the, for the third, fourth, and fifth year. If Again, a lot of it, we were kind of trying to keep it in the, in the same timeline of when we anticipated the U.S. Marshals uh, maintaining their, their uh, current inmate population with us. Um, they have obviously, as you know, they increased our population recently, or are going to be increasing our population due to construction work they're doing in L.A. So we wanted to kind of keep it consistent with this agreement and with the time frame that we anticipate them being here. We also still don't know what the, what's going to be um, the end result of the jail reuse study. So we limit it to two years, with obviously with the option to terminate prior to that. I think we have a 30-day option 30 to terminate this particular agreement at any, you know, when we need to. Okay, and uh, it just, you know, there, there is controversy around an organization this large. There's always going to be controversy. So one of the things that would have been would have been very useful for me in moving forward tonight is having that, that information, seeing how they've operated in our city since you say there's fewer grievances, right? So it would be really good for us to hear and highlight those grievances um, for us to really get excited. I, I can only speak for myself, really for me to get excited and moving forward. Right now I'm a little bit hesitant on this. Um, there still might be support on the, on the council on, with my colleagues, but that's what concerns me a little bit tonight. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. So um, I do have a question for um, on our city manager. Um, do we have an agreement signed with the U.S. Marshals as of today? We are actually operating under our previous agreement with them, and we just increased it. So, yes, we do have an agreement. So we do have one. Yes. Um, so, um, and Which I doesn't only... guarantee how many people, but allow, um, that they would actually use our jails for, but allow. So there's no guarantee. To... So I ask you, we're here moving on with the almost $5 million for two years with no guarantee of how many inmates were coming in. And that's the reason why I can't support that. Again, I don't know what business, what city goes into business anticipating anticipating and doing construction and making changes and entering into contracts like this without having those actual numbers and so for those reasons I can't be supportive it just doesn't make sense well none of the construction that we have asked for you to approve in the jail was contingent upon uh, any use it was necessary to preserve the asset the physical asset itself 
Uh, and in this case, I think w within the contract, we have the flexibility to have services redu reduced or increased as we need them to complement what or to s supply what services we need for the Marshall's contract. Um, so I, I believe we're trying to track those so that we don't oversupply um, and um, that this is certainly a necessary service to have a, for us to have in place before we can uh, have the marshals move in with additional inmates. I have another question if we're done over here. Got a question over here, Councilman? Yeah, just, just some things that I think I've heard and observed over the past uh, several months. Number one, I heard that there's like a 30 day cancellation clause. So, 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 like most of our contracts, if there is some uh, big decrease in service, we can either uh, scale down the, the, the amount of services or do a cancellation overall so the liability uh, isn't really uh, that high. Um, second, uh, I think because of the type of contracts that we have with federal agencies, I know they do frequent audits uh, of the service being provided. And so other states or jails that don't have those type of contracts don't have that type of oversight. Uh, and then finally, you know, as Councilman Martina Harrow kind of suggested to it, uh, here in California we have many more regulations than in other states, uh, particularly on the health and safety side, uh, particularly through uh, through OSHA, uh, they, uh, you know, that they're very concerned about the, the safety of uh, uh, not just employees, but in this case, inmates as well. So I'm pretty comfortable, especially given to that they have a, a pretty good track record in our community. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Councilor Sarmiento? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, um, you know, I, I I'm not as troubled by the, you know, by the. Um, contract amount because we do have that flexibility to scale down um, and I think if we are going to be increasing the number of beds with the um, with the anchor tenant that we have uh, the US Marshals I think it's commensurate right with um, making sure they remain what I'm a little troubled by is I remember going back and maybe Councilman Benavides can um, can uh, refresh my recollection but I know that when we went back to Washington to uh, visit with then our anchor tenants both the Marshals and um, and Homeland Security and ICE, I know that one of the things that they mentioned when they were considering renewing contracts was always the medical attention that we provided and whether or not it was sufficient. So I know we didn't dig down as deep as we should have back then, but I also remember hearing folks who had been in the, um, you had been detained and were inmates in our, um, in our jail, and they would always reference the attention. So that's my concern whether we did a robust enough circulation of this with other vendors that might have provided the service because how many responded to the uh, to the RFP do we do we know there's two they responded okay but um, there has been some outreach to try to find other providers but there's there's not a lot of uh, medical providers that provide uh, medical services at jails right so it's a small pool of potential it is a small pool folks that can't apply I just um, you know again you know we have a lot of regulations in the state that's fine but that doesn't mean that we should forgive those who are bad actors in other places where there's where they're less regulated so I am troubled by that um, I, I, I got to say you know we are probably limited and burdened by the fact that there just aren't a lot of vendors that provide these types of services but um, it uh, it is a concern for us to continue uh, working with folks that may be derelict in, in their responsibilities all right, so with that, what is the pleasure of the council? I, I do have a follow-up question. Go ahead. Uh, of staff, actually. If uh, clearly the, we do have tenants there now, uh, there is a, 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 we're in the process of increasing the, the uh, agreement or, or the, uh, the contract, if you will, and the revenue to the city uh, through the, the agreement with U.S. Marshals, one that, frankly, when it, was presented to us came in as a a, uh, uh, a significant uh, 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 help, if you will, given given our the uh, the situation that we've been in financially as city. So it, it came in to fill in a void. So my question is, if we don't move forward, does that jeopardize potentially the agreement that we have with U.S. Marshals? Will that be presented as a as a concern to them? Will that potentially put us back in a situation where uh, we well yes not it does because the uh, the current agreement runs through the end of this month and uh, we would need to provide uh, medical services to those inmates and we want to make sure we have a contract in place 
and we can show the U.S. Marshals that we were able to provide that service going forward? So, so tonight I, I'm, I'm inclined for that reason to, to move forward. However, uh, my colleagues uh, Sarmiento and Tinajero both presented valid questions that I would request staff, Madam uh, City Manager, to come back and address. I do recall on a trip to Washington, D.C., where there were uh, expressed concerns by the Department of Homeland Security, specifically in the area of, of medical services. So I would request that we go back and, and research and identify what those concerns were. I do know that, speaking with Chief Rojas at the time, he did mention that those concerns had been addressed. However, I would like to get a little bit more information uh, about that. That information presented a council memo. Uh, and then uh, Council Mitinajer also you know, had some, some legitimate questions as well with regard to uh, the experiences of this uh, provider in other uh, locations. And I would like to, to be able to have those uh, addressed, uh, those questions addressed and presented to Council as well. So with those concerns, that's a motion for approval? Uh, did we have a motion? Yeah. I'll second. Okay, those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Those opposed? Nay. No. So it passes four to three. So then uh, let me take something out of order. Mayor Pro Tem pointed out to me, I believe there's a young oath of office for Gregory Guzman, Alternate Youth Commission, Ward 2. Please come on down and let's uh, do the oath of office. He's got to go do his homework. Yeah, he's he's late. We should have uh, got him up here. Early. Got him up. Early. We're getting into homework time and that bed be time. An, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for letting me know. That should be a new policy. Anytime we have a uh, a K through eight person here, ready that, to we're get that we're aware. That we're aware of. Aware. I, Gregory Guzman, do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion that I will vow well and faithfully discharge the duties which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Good luck. So with that, uh, Madam Clerk, what is our next item? We're on 55A. All right. On 55A, we want to do 65A first because we have some speakers that are waiting for that. We have, I think, some young people and some senior folks as well. May so this oh, uh, starting off with the youth, uh, Irma Mateo, if you could please come and address us on item 65A. She's in the restroom. Okay, let's go with uh, uh, Francine uh, O'Harris, or G. Harris, Francine G. Harris. And after Francine, let's uh, have Edwin Ruiz, if uh, Edwin could step forward and sit on the front uh, row, and then Susana Sandoval, if she could come down as well, and then followed by Desi Reyes, he can sit further back, no, I'm kidding, Desi, I, oh, there you are, all right, and then followed by uh, Jeff, uh, no, no, that's the next item, so Irma Mateo after, after uh, Desi. Please go ahead. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor. And Bring the Council. microphone down. And Councilman. There you go. All right. <laughs> I'm here uh, to support uh, the fence for Birch Park. I have some of the seniors here with us, and we really thank you for everything you have done. Uh, we have raised the Santa Ana Senior Club and also the advisory board. We have raised $28,000 for this fence to go around Birch Park and the center. Uh, we only need $120,000 to finish this fence off. Thank you. Thank you for your good work. Thank and you. thank you all for coming out. Do we have uh, other speakers? Edwin Ruiz, Susana Sandoval. Come on down. Go ahead. And Desi, get ready. Um, hello, my name is Irma. I am part of the Youth for Active and Safe Communities. And um, me and my organization are grateful for the inclusion of skate elements in the new parks, but we would like you to consider us doing the development process and design. I would like you to continue looking for more resources and opportunities for more safe and open spaces for youth to live an active and healthy life. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Edwin or Susana or Desi? Oh, good evening. My name is Edwin Reese, and I am part of the Youth for Active and Safe Communities. Um, I would like to thank you for supporting the inclusion of skating elements in the new parks. It is really great to know that there will be more safe spaces for youth to continue to be active and healthy. As you know, Santa Ana is one of the most populated and youngest cities in the nation. But it is also one of the most obese cities in the country and state. This, in part, speaks into the lack of available and proper recreational spaces for our community where we can feel safe and comfort comfortable to go outside and be active. Just how we see jungle gyms for the little kids at every park, I would like to see skate plazas in every park for teens. Just because we get older and, and our interests, interests change does not mean that we stop being active. It's just that sometimes the ad adequate facilities are not provided for us to continue living a healthy, active lifestyle. As Santa Ana plans for the future, I would like for you to encourage city staff and departments to be more intentional in working with the community to see what the needs are and be able to collaborate in seeing these skate places come to life. I would like to see both youth and parents of these young skaters involved in the planning process of the design and development of these parks. Many of us have gone to other cities and seen how skating elements, whether they are big or small, incorporated into other parks. I encourage both council members and parks and recreation staff to continue seeking resources and opportunities to enhance our current parks with both in regards to safety. But our recreational facilities, we would appreciate the opportunity to work alongside city staff to create these safe skate, safe skate spaces and make Santa Ana a more skatable and healthier community for all to live and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Susana Sandoval and then Desi. Okay, good evening, Mayor Pulido and City Council members. I give to you 17 pages of petitions signed by hundreds and hundreds of residents in support of the security cameras at our parks. I am here to thank the staff for their thorough review and analysis for priority projects and recommendations for projects to fund that are CDBG eligible. Parks and Recreation and Community Service established the criteria to identify and prioritize parks. Number one, safety. Two, deferred maintenance. And three, opportunities to add park recreational space. In following the established criteria, staff recommends the security cameras for the seven identified parks to be approved. As co-chairperson for the Santa Ana Healthy Neighborhoods Alliance, we support the city staff recommendations and urge you to vote yes for security cameras. Safety is the number one issue for residents. 
residents. The Alliance has held focus groups with residents and safety is rated the number one concern and need for security cameras. Going by Madison Park almost daily, we see illegal activities such as the consumption of alcohol, children and families are exposed to the drug dealing and prostitution and vandalism of property. Once the cameras are installed, parks will be utilized more by parents, families and our senior citizens. Right now there is fear and people go to parks in other cities where there is security. We understand that there are other projects proposed, including a skate park. Staff will continue to seek funding for a skate park to be added as resources become available. Staff are already working on funding and location options for a future skate park. The security cameras are a necessity, not a luxury. It will be an exemplary demonstration for our city council to cast a unanimous vote for the security cameras, showing that you too have safety as the top priority for the community and respect for the process that the staff completed in recommending the cameras be approved. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Desi. And Madam Clerk, if you can start the lights on the council members as we proceed with our meeting. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Desi with Saddleback View. I'm here to encourage you to support this ordinance. Uh, Saddleback View is turning 11 years old today. Um, not today, but this year, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, Jose Solorio, you were a ward um, council member at the time. You helped us to get that park built. Michelle was in Parks and Rec many, many years ago, and you got, you were there too when we made that happen. Sarmiento is our council person now. It's a great park, it's matured, trees are beautiful. Uh, it's a clean park, family use it. Uh, once in a while we do get the, the graffiti, but I use my Santa Ana app, which is great. I encourage everybody to use it. It gets done the next day. Um, we do need some lighting. I drive by there once in a while, 11, 12 o'clock in the evening. And if I see people are not supposed to be there, I call the police, but it's really hard to talk to the dispatcher to describe whoever's there when there's no lighting. Um, so that would help tremendously in deterring you know, the wrong people coming into the parks and keeping it a family park. It's a great park, it's a great neighborhood park, and we want to keep it like that. And I'm here to represent the whole neighborhood. They're not here, but they sent me as a liaison. Thank you very much for all the work you guys have done and continue the great work. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work as well, Desi. You've been there for many, many years. Thank you. So with that, um, I'd entertain a motion. Move. That's a good move. Is there a second? Second. There's several seconds, Madam Clerk, you pick. Do you want to make some comment? Uh, Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I want to thank all the, the uh, uh, residents who came in and spoke to address uh, the site and also uh, appreciate uh, the staff uh, in their recommendation here there have been some some uh, positive uh, uh, adjustments here hearing from both council and and uh, members of the community uh, creating some elements some opportunities for for young people we heard from them uh, here tonight the uh, uh, positive uh, recreational uh, activities, skate elements, uh, based on what staff are recommending here tonight, uh, at least in two of the upcoming parts, which we probably won't see for a number of years, uh, but at least there's some some uh, uh, response uh, there that that uh, staff is is uh, designating, which definitely appreciate that. Some of the the comments that some of the staff made is uh, requesting that they uh, be invited to be a part of the, the process uh, in identifying some of what these skate elements uh, might look like. Uh, I would encourage staff to to uh, uh, invite the youth to the table. They're, they're after all the experts in in, in the area. Uh, the uh, uh, and also just looking at other ways that we might be able to address or, or uh, create uh, some of these opportunities even within existing parks, uh, so that it, it, it isn't years out, but something that we might be able to see. Uh, uh, sooner, you know, even as we look at the uh, capital improvements. To conclude, you're going to go red uh, soon. Sure, we'll do. Uh, with regard to the cameras, there were some, some legitimate questions that were presented at the last, last uh, uh, meeting by one of my colleagues. I, I, I do hope that the cameras will serve as, as a deterrent. Uh, some of the comments that were made last time by staff is that they really will serve more as uh, an opportunity for us to review if and when crime does occur. Uh, so uh, I, I would request some, some updates with regard to uh, 
how they're being used, monitored, and, and it, it's a half million dollar investment there. Uh, so definitely, you know, would hope to be able to see some of the, uh, the, the direct benefits. Appreciate all of the, again, the, the comments, Desi, uh, you know, the, who's, who's been out in the community for, for a long time, uh, mentioned some of the changes in, in some of the uh, uh, council uh, representation and all. Uh, one of our colleagues has moved into Thank another uh, ward, and, and uh, at this time, you know, we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, want to continue to serve and support uh, the community uh, out there. So with that, Thank I'll be supporting Thank you. Councilor well. Sarmiento, please. So we're on timer, so I'm going to go very quick and brief. But I just wanted to thank Councilman Benavides because he's always been a champion of skate parks. And, you know, when we think about that, we think about that as a diversion or a luxury, but it really isn't. It's, it's also a public safety measure because it keeps kids doing things that are positive, keeps things, you know, keeps kids from doing other things. So I think we have to see that as um, something that, Madam City Attorney, if we could you know, have you and your successor see that as a priority for us. Um, it is important, and I know we've thought about this even as far back as when we were looking at the downtown space on the corner of 4th and French. Um, and I think the mayor was working on that as well. So it's been a very deferred um, asset that we've tried to get online. But, um, but I, you know, I want to thank those that um, are going to be helped tonight. And I know that's where the sort of the, 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 you know, how we're torn, and I think that's where all of us are torn, is that we'd like to do a skate park, but, you know, the folks who are going to be receiving um, help tonight, like Saddleback View, like Madison Park, number one, thank you for your patience, and thank you for coming out here tonight, and thank you for all the signatures, and the Senior Center, thank you for everything that you've done, because you've done heavy lifting that we're just augmenting here tonight. So, um, you know, as much as we'd like to do, these are finite funds, but I think we're going to affect a lot of people's lives in a positive way tonight by adopting this. So we should all feel good about that. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Very quickly, I just wanted to give out a shout out to our seniors because, and to um, Gerardo Moet and his staff, long overdue, as we all know, it's been five, six plus years as we've been talking about the Birch Park fence and also, you know, the AC, and in particular, our seniors have been raising dollars as well over the years. And so it's just not they're over here asking for a handout, but they have contributed themselves and, and brought, you know, that they couldn't bring in their poster today, but some of the issues that they're facing at Birch Park as it pertains to the needles and the homelessness. And so definitely is definitely needed. But I also just wanted to thank the other uh, folks that have come out here, whether it's Desi, whether it's Eard, my, or those others that are here advocating and one of my issues and I'm glad that there's equity across um, you know the the different um, um, districts across the city and making sure that we're able to help um, uh, with every park as it pertains to safety or, or making enhancements but particular <coughs> on the camera side um, I, I want to thank staff for for um, providing that insight. The other thing, you know, I, I would just ask for us to get regular updates, and, and I'm a true believer in, in predictive policing and intelligent policing, and this is these are tools for predictive policing and intelligent policing, and just making sure that we're able to utilize them in a form as a tool, um, you know, because it's not the end all be all to public safety and capturing, you know, criminals. It's a tool, to, uh, an enhancement to help our law enforcement, and so I think it's, it's a good opportunity for us to utilize, but wanting to make sure that we have that data and we're able to capture um, what's happening in those parks so we can make better informed decisions. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I move the item forward. And I think we had a first and a second already. Yes, we did. So we'll have another one. Council Member Solorio. Uh, th thank you, Mayor. I want to th thank my colleagues for all the supportive uh, comments. Uh, we do need these security cameras, and they were ranked by, by the staff. But I would tell you we have more parks. There's need for more cameras and more lighting. Council Member Vega says if you don't have good lighting, especially at night, the, the cameras aren't, aren't as valuable. Uh, with respect to the skate parks, you know, I think we'd like to see more of that. And you know, I was part of the important votes way back when, when we put the skate park at, at Centennial. It would be nice to have more. Uh, but, but on that topic, I think when we look at the need for additional sports facilities, we really ought to have that as a capital improvement project discussion in terms of the various sports needs, whether they be for deferred maintenance or, or new items. I know that in addition to skate parks, I hear uh, needs related to our baseball program, our soccer program, 
tennis program, uh, et cetera. So let's not leave out, you know, certain uh, certain sports, basketball. You know, we saw, you know, how much support that there there, there was for that. Um, and also, in addition to, to lights and the security cameras, we still need park rangers. You know, we have fifty plus. We have fifty plus parks. Uh, in our city, and we really only have one full-time park ranger, and then maybe another park ranger and a half, you know, kind of part-time with you know the, the overtime of officers. So we need we need a we need a program uh, on that, whether it be through retirees figuring that out, uh, or reclassifications, or unarmed officers, or a combination of that. But we definitely need to do better by by that program. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Real quick. Go I, ahead. I agree that we need park ranges, but I think we also have to be very careful. When we don't have a when we have a structural deficit, to not start promoting something to the public like we can actually afford it. Those so positions are in the budget. Let's, let's be realistic. They're, 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 yeah, they are. Give, they're the officer positions. Give, I'm speaking. We could barely yeah. give our SEIU a raise, and uh, you know we're talking about something that we can't give. Let's be honest about it. That's all I got to say. Well, then, I, just an important clarification: Go ahead. safety item. If we could have the the police chief or or, or the city manager. We, we don't need if, to if, debate if that. It's not agenda. Aware, but it's not agenda. It was just a the, comment. The officers are comment. in the budget, and we have eighty positions in the budget that are fillable. Is that correct, city manager? And we don't have the money to fill no, them. That's no, my but argument. we do. That's been clarified, city manager. Let clarify whether we have those briefly, briefly, and then I want to the move on. Th these are positions in the budget, um, and we're having trouble filling mm -hmm. them, and we, we are looking at designing a new program and approaching it a different way, and we'll be back to talk to council about that. And at that point, you can make a decision about any uh, funding and, and whether you think that's the appropriate way for us to spend Anybody who has not Thank spoken? You. Councilman Villegas? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say I spoke with the uh, city manager this morning regarding that issue at great length, so we want to address it. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries. Um, Madam uh, Clerk, I believe we uh, skipped earlier 55A. Yes. Let me go back to 55A. I would entertain so a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, I need to recruit myself because my it's husband It's too late. We already voted. <laughs> okay. The, uh, second by Solorio. Where are we? Where are we? Which item? 55A. It's the emergency preparedness group. Okay, I thought it was the other item because Second of the... Okay. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. 55B, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Mr. Mayor, I have comment on this. Okay, do you second as well? Or I, do you don't, have I don't second. Um, All this right. Is a, we need a second first. Let's get a second. Second. Second by Benavides. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. This is approve a resolution to amend classification and compensation plan for the annual budget of Community Development Agency Director and per Personnel uh, Service Executive Director. And so if I can just get a response of what the increase um, in... In salary, this is going to to both of these positions. If I could get some kind of clarification, or is this just a bump in, in in classification that automatically gets a salary increase? It's a recommended salary increase for those two positions. You have a vacant CDA position. It's in order for us to be able to recruit the best, and you have a soon-to-be vacant director of personnel position. And this is to attract the top layer candidate. That's why I wanted clarification. Thank you, Ed. All right, with that, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Uh, 55C, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I would comment. Mayor, I have comment. Go ahead, comp by Mayor Pro Tem, then Benavides. Mr. Benavides, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, what we're looking at here is, is a, and I don't know if, I know staff presented. Uh, some information to us. I don't know if there was a or had has a PowerPoint here uh, on our, on the dais for for council. Ultimately, what we're looking at here is is addressing what we've seen is the issue of homelessness and how it's been uh, impacting and affecting our, our community. Uh, and and my, my only comment here of council or, or of staff is uh, here. What we're looking at doing is creating a position, essentially a manager that would be able to be the the, the point person. Uh, it's it's that much, and I appreciate staff's uh, response and uh, and creating this. This has grown to become such a concern that we need a, one person that's wholly dedicated to helping to coordinate 
uh, city, city resources around addressing this concern. And, uh, and, and that it, we, we have been, I think we've tried a number of different things and we continue to do that, right? From creating housing to working with the nonprofits to working with the county. Uh, and I'm one that, that in, the, uh, in the past have made comments and encouraged staff and was working with previous city manager on uh, trying to address things. Um, a lot of folks out there, they're, they're, they're in a situation where they've had some, some challenges down and out and they, they need some definitely a humanitarian approach and support. Uh, and, and I see that that's part of what we're looking at coordinating with faith-based organizations and such. Uh, Things have also grown to the point where we also need to look at uh, ensuring that we're not making our, our city and our civic center in particular uh, a, uh, too, too, too much of a, of a draw, too, too comfortable for folks. And my, my specific concern is the state, the, the city of Anaheim uh, took a step, took some action last week to declare a state of emergency, and they're working with a, a number of different tools, resources, and, and, and law enforcement to try to intentionally make their area you know, less desirable and comfortable for folks and uh, moving folks out of, of the, uh, the, 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 the riverbed and other areas in their town. And if, as they do that and other cities do, uh, take that action, uh, the city of Santa Ana will likely become more of a magnet to the folks that are being uh, moved and displaced in those areas. And as, as much as I definitely agree that we need to approach things from and approach people who are there as people and, 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 and compassionately, we also need to be very uh, uh, prudent and careful that we again have a, uh, a balanced approach and that we don't end up becoming uh, the, the, the place where more of uh, folks, uh, homeless folks, end up uh, uh, flocking to, and then where we end up shouldering that completely on our own as a city. Uh, so that, that's my, my, my caution, my request of, count, of, of staff, is that we look at and think through uh, how we will uh, very proactively uh, address uh, the, these matters and, uh, and, and begin to ensure that we're taking steps to reduce our, our numbers out there. Uh, so that, that's, that's my, my comment. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be very quick. Yes, I, I see that the recommendation action is to create a San, Santa Ana Homeless Service Manager position, and I had a meeting today with our interim city manager, and she went over some of the points, and I, I'm supportive. Um, the thing that I did bring up here that I didn't see here, maybe it's part of the improved internal coordination between city agencies involved providing enforcement related to homeless population within Santa Ana, is that the city entered into an MOU that I shared with our city attorney and I've shared with Anaheim and I've shared with other cities that um, many of us did not know that uh, we've entered into an MOU with the County of Orange and, um, and I shared that with them. That's it's about 17 years old. It's time that we come to the table and have a, a discussion with the county and revisit that MOU and was it, what is it can be done. As you know, today and yesterday in the paper it was Orange you know, two weeks ago it was Anaheim, three weeks ago it was Fountain Valley. Who's now left? Santa Ana. What we don't want to happen is that, you know, we keep on moving homeless, you know, from city to city. We have to have a coordinated approach. I had a meeting in June. Unfortunately, only four cities of the 34 cities came to the table. They had staff there. And so, um, you know, and I said this to our, our city manager very candidly today. Look, we can talk all we want about coordination and coming together obviously it's a lot of just talk in my per in, in my personal opinion because you know we could have meetings and continue to do that but there's going to have to be some action and it can be individual action and so i think it's time that we coordinate with the with the cities that are adjacent to the santa Ana riverbed and start there because putting that big net out to all 34 cities in the county that's that's too big of an issue and, and there's a lot of cities in south county that don't believe they have a problem and so you know i think one of the first steps in regards to coordination is dealing with this MOU and bringing to the table and bringing some conditions because one of my main concerns and beyond the compassionate and wanting to make sure that we provide, you know, um, 
shelter for homeless and, and provide you know public safety as well the concern for me is water quality and and as it pertains to the to, to the water water quality control act and 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 you know not providing access to restrooms you're seeing in san diego that's Michelle, causing MRSA on and so forth there's major health issues that i brought up here in the civic center and it's now expanding that we really need to take a look at because it, it's very serious thank you thank you council solorio thank you mayor and this item is very important i will try to uh, stick to the time but uh, may, may go just, just a, a little bit over so a, a year ago this city declared homelessness a crisis in santa ana uh, but that plan was really more of a civic center plan i think this is a start of the city essentially saying we need a, a citywide plan and a, and a quarterback for this effort uh, addressing this crisis needs to be a shared responsibility uh, by all our cities uh, i kind of look at two co-equal goals number one um, helping uh, the home, uh, the home, helping homeless residents address their housing, employment, mental health, drug treatment, and other basic needs, uh, and then the second, ensuring the safety of all residents, workers, and visitors in Santa Ana. I have a specific list that I'll give to the coordinator, of the staff, and my colleagues with some suggestions that I've heard, you know, from throughout the community. You know, and it starts number one with uh, continuing to develop. Uh, and entitled the 1,500 plus affordable housing units, many for homeless that we have in the works, uh, requesting that the County of Orange replace the temporary courtyard facility to a permanent uh, facility. Uh, also that our facilities get prioritized for Santa Ana uh, residents. Uh, we also need to support the county's effort to uh, build a homeless shelter at the Great Park. They have 100 acres there, uh, and we ought to encourage them and hold them accountable to building a shelter there. We also ought to support Senator uh, Morlock's proposal for uh, transforming the Fairview Developmental Center into a mental health facility uh, in Costa Mesa. Uh, also, we ought to consider, for example, passing a city ordinance, making it unlawful for other cities and hospitals to drop off their homeless in Santa Ana, unless it's with the approval of the receiving agency or shelter. Uh, things like the needle exchange program and the Narcan program, uh, it's fine participating in those, but only if other cities also participate. Uh, also, we ought to look at doing what Sacramento is doing, that, for example, they say that uh, Aggressive panhandling is not allowable, especially in areas within 35 feet uh, from roadways and intersections, ATMs, uh, banks, gas stations, uh, and transit stops. Uh, we ought to reclassify the entire civic center area into a park so we can have uh, more control over opening and closing uh, time. It's Jose, if you can. Yes, yes, just a couple more quick items here. We, we ought to enforce against drug use, drug sales, physical Point. assaults, sexual assaults, and criminal actions. Uh, and finally, uh, on the MOU uh, with the sheriffs, we ought to say that they ought to reimburse us for our enforcement efforts because we're spending a lot of resources, a lot of it with problems they're creating. All right, let's keep to the time. Juan, go ahead, please. Mr. Mayor, I just want to say I'm in support of this. We need someone on point to address this issue. This issue is too big. I know some of my colleagues here are asking uh, where, what's the status, what's going on, what are we actually doing, uh, is there an update, at least having a manager to head this up, you know, our own homeless are, so to speak, so we have a, a go-to person who is working with everyone within the city and um, I think that's a very, very uh, good idea to have. And yes, I'm, you know, we need to have more talk with the county. I try to reach out to the county all the time, every week, to find out what's going on. But uh, having this additional person there is going to be a great help. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Sarmiento? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, um, I want to thank the committee that spent some time working on this. And I do agree that those 100 acres over at the Great Park are a great um, it's a great opportunity I think it's important that they absorb some of that you know everybody was fine when Santa Ana shouldered this burden of the homelessness problem by itself nobody else in the county was talking about it it wasn't an imperative now that we see that the population is growing beyond our borders it's suddenly a real urgent you know um, issue for everybody so my concern is that the other 33 cities really need to see this as a regional county problem um, I, I, um, I'm concerned about 
de about designating somebody or creating a position that's my only um, concern with this I do believe we need a point person I do think it's important that we need to have somebody but I don't know if creating a position is the best way I know other cities what they've done is they is they've um, retained a consultant to come on board on a pilot program to see if that is successful and if it's successful we can go ahead and renew that contract, extend it, and really have the private sector work at the look at this a little bit better because we unfortunately have tried to do a lot of these things are, that are enumerated. I'm pretty fed up with the county. I think that we've been great neighbors to them. We've absorbed a lot of what they've done. They fenced off their campus conveniently to do rehab when they should have spent that money to address the problem that was on their doorstep, not on ours, and they pushed it all to our side of the street. So now, I mean, L.A. had the same problem and they sued the county because they realized that they were sitting on millions and millions of dollars that they were receiving from the Housing and Urban Development um, uh, Department and they were able to recoup that. I spoke to some colleagues, counterparts of ours on the Anaheim City Council and they're very concerned as well because as soon as they, they declared their crisis, well, they're worried that we may declare a cr another crisis in the city and so we just keep shifting this population back and forth amongst each other and the problem doesn't get solved. So the problem really is with the, with the agency that's vested with this right and that's the county. So I'd like us to look, uh, look at, Madam City Attorney, you know, what are our rights? As uh, do we have standing to go ahead and file something? And can we join with other cities like Anaheim and like others that are similarly situated that are facing the same problem? And, you know, we need to get some, um, some of their, you know, some attention. But I, uh, you know, as it is, we've done a lot of what's on this list. We just, um, you know, it's fallen, unfortunately, on just, um, you know, a silent response from the, from the board. And so I'm just a little concerned that we're, um, we're trying to act in good faith when others aren't. Thank you. Now, I'll start the line. I'm going to speak, but I, I won't even get to yellow. Um, I think when we hire this coordinator, they should, amongst other things, meet with folks like Larry Haynes from Mercy House. Because, you know, they have a real understanding of resources and what, what isn't being mobilized that maybe could be. Uh, also, I've been meeting with the mayor of Anaheim, Garden Grove, Irvine, uh, and Tustin, trying to figure out what can we do. And something that Tustin has put forth is they have about three acres that they've identified at the air station. And they want to see what can be done with that property. So as we go after... You know, Irvine doing something at the Great Park through the county. If Tustin can do something and, 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 and that by example shows that, you know, we can all participate and help, I think that's a, a, a very good development. But I'll tell you, I've never seen it this bad. Uh, been around the city a long time. I've never seen the homeless problem this bad. They're now going into neighborhoods, sneaking into people's backyards and spending the night there. And then in the morning, sometimes they don't want to leave. Um, you know, it, 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 it's just way, way, way out of control. So we need to be uh, compassionate, but we have to have a firmness and, and the ability to take this back uh, under, under control. So with that, um, I believe we have a motion and a second. Uh, those in favor, please you're all, say You're aye. almost at red there. Pardon? I, I said you're almost at red. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I am because you stopped me. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Once we take a vote, you got to stop the clock because at that point the speech is over. It's like in tennis, you know, when they're going to start to serve, they stop the uh, they stop the clock and they let you. You, you were serve. yellow for a while. And you're in red now. All right, 65A, B. All right, where you did it? That's right. It's the. I'd entertain a motion. I think we have some speakers. We have one speaker. Mayor, I misspoke. This is what I need to speak at. Right. Uh, step out of the room. My husband works for a company that represents a, a hauling company. So why did you step out earlier? Well, as long as I was up anyway. Right. I just took a break. So. <laughs> All right. Let me have uh, Jeff Snow come on down. Please go ahead, Jeff. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council Members. I'm Jeff Snow with Rainbow Environmental Services, a Republic Services company and the state of California's leader in diversion and recycling for larger cities. 
The City of Santa Ana began a journey to explore options in December of 2015, which culminated on June 20th of 2017 with an amended motion directing staff to commence three different items. Number one, to consolidate multiple agreements into one streamlined restated agreement. That has been done. Number two, to negotiate a one-year extension with some flexibility to allow for enough time for a comprehensive RFP. That is being done and is referenced as item 65B tonight, requesting a 30-day extension. The third item the council directed staff was to commence an RFP immediately. That has not been done at all to my knowledge, uh, nor is any reference to it in tonight's staff report. With all great respect to the hard work done by staff, we hope that staff will stay aligned with council's direction. We remain enthusiastic about offering our services, sustainability programs, and community support package to the city of Santa Ana. Thank you. Thank you. Let me bring it to council. I think that was the only speaker we had. So I'll bring it back to Council for comment. Councilor Solodi. Yeah, a question to staff. I don't know who the point person is on this item. By default, uh, you know, Deputy City Manager Cortez. Uh, uh, are both parties interested in this extension? Or, because this obviously is staff making this recommendation, but can you speak to uh, the contractor's interest in in this uh, extension and generally how are the discussions going? Sure, uh, good evening Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. Just a point of clarification, the third item, uh, just to clarify, was that the city staff would initiate a request for proposal on solid waste services to be effective upon the completion of the one year extension agreement. So I just wanted to put that out there for clarification purposes because we had a speaker who spoke on behalf of that. Uh, there have been uh, discussions with the current waste hauler. Uh, there are a number of proposals that have been submitted, but staff is currently in the evaluation process. We do need more than 90 days to do the evaluation, and at this point in time, we are requesting an additional 30 days to complete that assessment. Uh, the assessment and the item that will be for you on October 17th will have a number of different options, which also include the release of the RFP for City Council consideration. Okay, I, I just want to make sure this doesn't continue to drag on, because I know we've hired consultants to do reports. Uh, there's been numerous uh, extensions, 90-day uh, review, and uh, uh, but I appreciate that this is staff making this request, and we Correct. need to you know understand the consequences of this. Uh, agreement, so I do uh, thank you for this uh, clarification. Uh, additional questions, Councilor Benavides. So, so just, and, and I think you, you've pretty much addressed it, but what, what I understood for clarification, you have received, because we did give a 90 day, uh, Correct. Uh, uh, I guess nearly nine days ago. Uh, so at this point, you've received what you uh, need to receive from. The, uh, the current from the existing uh, waste hauler, correct. And at this point, then staff just needs this time, and and 30 days from today, you'll be ready to be correct. able to present and make recommendations Our goal is so, to that, bring, so that council can take action. Correct. Our goal is to bring this item back for city council consideration on uh, October so 7th. I appreciate the fact that staff is being thorough and, and is preparing. Yes. So, given all that that information, I'm going to move the item. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second, but we have more comment. Mr. Mayor Pro Town. I, I have a substitute motion. I'm, it's time that we move forward with, with an RFP process. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I think this, this, this city staff is being disingenuous, is not moving in the direction that this council has asked. I am fed up. I am frustrated. You, you now need 30 more days. We gave you 90 days. How much more time do you need? And, and what I hear with the offer is, is that you're going to give that waste management is looking at giving three years of upfront money. What does that do for the city of Santa Ana? We don't need no any upfront money. We have $40 million in our reserves. If we needed to borrow money, we can get it from there. So I don't understand what benefit 
We are giddy. And so let's stop playing games. This is the biggest contract that this council will approve. It's over $150 million over a 10-year period. It hasn't gone to, to bid for the past 50-plus years. We have a, a responsibility and an obligation to do things right. And I don't know why we continue to play these games. It's time that we go to RFP. That is the best approach that we need to take here because I believe that there is not fairness in this process. I don't believe that what is happening here is that what you're trying to do is come to us at the 11th hour to say that we have to go with this solid waste contractor. And that's not fair to, to, to the residents of this community. And I've shared with you all and you're, that you're in violation of Proposition 218. And I will continue. And, 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 and I've, I've been trying to be very respectful and very nice and having you guys go through this process. But I'm up to here. I'm ready. Again, I've said I would go. I'm ready to go to the state. I'm ready to do things that we need to do to get us in, in compliance and in order to, to move us in this direction. I just don't understand why we can't do things the right way, why we continue 30 days, 60 days, when we're not resolving anything. It, the best approach that you all can give as practitioners is to tell us that we need to go through an RFP process and let us deliberate and who the best person. It may be when we go through an RFP process that waste management is the best person for the job, but let us deliberate and go through that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think the Mayor Pro Tem said it well. I, I'm a little perplexed about, you know, why we couldn't maybe entertain that proposal during a procurement. We could have. There's nothing, nothing to prohibit the existing hauler to have submitted a proposal in competition with others. So I know that this um, council took, you know, a very decisive change in direction to try to procure everything that comes before us. It's really a bad look for us and the optics are horrible for us not to have gone out to bid on a contract as valuable as this one for as long as this has gone on. I mean, it's been over 50 years and I think we're not getting a good return, um, uh, giving a good return to our residents because we're saying you're stuck with this hauler regardless of, you know, all the other potential um, vendors that might be able to bring benefits to the city. So, uh, you know, my concern is that, you know, we have to be genuine, we have to be, um, we have to be thorough, and I think that there are other vendors that may not compete as well. And this is, no, this is nothing to damage the reputation of our existing hauler, but it's to their benefit that they compete. If they have a good product, if they have a good business model, they'll prevail. If they submit a good, strong proposal, look, they'll outbid the others, but let them compete. Like we've, like we've required everybody else that does services for the city to compete. And I think because they're there and they can offer this great proposal, well, what about the other vendors? Maybe they can offer a more attractive proposal. So we should at least go through that exercise because it's our responsibility. We have a fiduciary obligation. And I think Mayor Pro Tem is right. We may be in violation of Prop 218 by doing this. And if we're not, it's completely unethical for us to be um, exercising this as we have uh, for so long. So again, you know, I don't know. And I, I remember the public works director coming up and saying, an RFP is going to take me two years. And I thought, I've never seen an RFP or a procurement last that long. We could have been done by now, and waste could have been the prevailing bidder by now. They could have been providing services under a new contract, better benefits to the, to the residents, and maybe a better proposal to the city. But we just keep doing this, and it looks like, this looks like amateur hour. So it's unfortunate. Okay, time is up. I've got a quick question. Go ahead and start the clock again, please. Last time we got into this, I think somebody on staff said we need to wait because there's going to be a new dump opening up or some new rates or something that could impact the contract and make it more competitive. So, you know, we needed to wait. I, I, I remember something about that at some point. Now, just restate what you're saying now that you need 30 days in order to come back to give us the option to go out to bid? Is, is that what you're saying? No, the direction from the city council uh, when this item was before, uh, before all of you, 
uh, included three items. One of them was to approve a one-year extension with waste management that would allow us to go out and do the RFP process. The RFP process itself takes about six months to complete, but then there's a nine-month period for implementation. And this is where Fred referred to the process taking anywhere between 15 to possibly even 16 or 18 months uh, in terms of completion. So the direction from the city council was, look, instead of coming back with a one-year extension, why don't you go out and seek if there's any additional options other than just a one-year extension. So that was a direction that the city staff received. That's the direction that we've been following. So at the current moment, we have had discussions with waste management. They, are, they have submitted proposals. At this point in time, the staff is still evaluating. Well, I'm somewhat at a loss, uh, so why don't we just go out to bid now if that's what we want to do? I mean, you say it's going to take a year, so let's start. The, the current agreement will expire June of 2018, so we're at the point where we're maybe nine months, ten months uh, to do an RFP. If the direction from the city council is to go out and RFP, we can give it our shot of completing something within that uh, period of time, but again, it is... Uh, the direction that received earlier was to go back and look at other alternatives other than just a one-year extension. It, All right, it's, it's, Council, start the clock again. Councilor Benavides? It, is it my understanding, and I won't get to you, is it my understanding that the RFP is going to be one of the options coming in 30 Absolutely. days, right? Yes. So in 30 uh, days, we'll be able to take action. Absolutely. That can be one of the actions. We just say that or, we, or some of the other options or direction or requests that we ask for staff to come back with. So I think we have motion second. I mean, we, we, they're following what we asked them to do before. They're just asking for They're asking for, for more time. Can, can I just ask a procedural question? In the event sure. that the, and yeah, start the clock again. In the event that, um, in, in the event that this motion fails, what's the, what's the uh, outcome or what, what's the next step on this? They continue working. Yeah. Yeah. They'll come back in 30 Correct. days. They come back in 30 days. Right. Uh -huh. So no matter what, you're coming back in 30 days, so. Potentially. All right, well, I look, I just want, we I just want to say Robert's correct. Everything he said is correct from the last time when, you, when we were here. Mr. Mayor, I do want to state, though, we gave 90 days. Why a 30-day more continued? So I think, you know, 90 days was sufficient. I don't understand why waste management didn't know the sense of urgency. Um, you know, to submit this so that our staff can do the evaluation. And this is where I get frustrated because I think games are being played here. Because we said 90 days, no more than 90 days, so now we're going to give a 30-day continuous. How important is this to waste management to give their options? Obviously, to me, it's saying that it's not important because we now need, because at the, I don't know when they provided you all this information, now that's taking our staff, saying that they need an additional 30 days. I just, I can't support that. I think ultimately we need to go to RFP and, you know, explore the different options. Things have changed out in this industry dr drastically, all the new laws. This is the time for us to do this. And so, you know, I'm perplexed and, and I just can't support the 30 day continuous. When did waste come back to you with the new information that you now have to evaluate? You know, I don't have that exact dates right now. Both our executive director as well as Christy Kendick, who oversees the waste management contract, are currently um, uh, out on vacation. So I do not have that information unless uh, we have someone from Public Works that can speak to that. And we, should, we shouldn't beat up on you. It's like beating up on the messenger because really we should have our public works director out here with, with uh, Ms. Kend Kendick. So, you know, look, I mean, why aren't they here? They knew this was before us tonight, at least one of them or somebody here to answer questions on this. This is, this is a very large contract and it's got some terribly complicated politics attached to it. Uh all right, so look, we have a motion, and then we had a substitute motion. What, Did can you second the substitute Mayor Pro Tem, can you restate your substitute, substitute motion? Substitute motion is to go out to RFP immediately. I'll second that. Okay, so we have that. And if that doesn't pass, then we'll go back to the original motion. Those in favor of the just go out to bid, say aye. 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 So that's four to just go out to bid. 
So now I don't know what you do. We go out to bed. We go out to bed at 4, 4 So. Just, just to make sure, and, and I'm not staff on this issue, but I want the council to understand, yeah, that's your direction, they can do that. Um, the question to staff will be, will they be able to accomplish that and, and implement that prior to the June 2018 And if deadline? not, then they ask for an extension. Exactly, and I just want to make sure that you understand year, that's They'll say we need precise. three months because we're not done. Precisely, that's exactly what I wanted to, yes. to make that's sure that you exactly. understood as part of that action. So what, what I'm just perplexed by is, is all Start this, the all clock. This, He's going to ask a question. Just all, all this work that has gone in. Uh, we gave staff direction. I, I'd be, I'd be extremely frustrated if I was a staff member and, and f would feel very unsupported by council tonight. We gave them direction. They're going through. They're doing their evaluation, doing all the numbers, doing all this, their analysis, and and almost there, we're, we're telling them, no, we don't want you to to do that after all. Uh, so one is just, I, I just feel for staff, and I, I just think I'm perplexed by, by our action tonight. And the, the other thing is, uh, question is for the city attorney, is, is with the, the current hauler, yeah, I know she's, she's tied up right now. Uh, you can be our pretend city attorney uh, right now. Uh, we can, I'll, I'll restate the question, but, but this is quite my question for Madam for city attorney, a question for you. Yes. With our, our current hauler, Mm -hmm. At the last action the council took, we, we sent them and staff to go out and work on some analysis, work on some proposals, and at this point, before that even gets considered, we're uh, essentially saying we're not going to consider. Do we put ourselves at all in a, in a uh, uh, kind of liability or, 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 or kind of a... I don't think we have any liability from an agreement to agree standpoint, but um, one of the things I, I think that we need to think about in terms of process is this. Um, agendized on your, on your agenda for tonight was the question of whether you wanted to extend your conversations with the hauler for another 30 days. Um, what was not on here is whether the city council wanted to take the action to now immediately issue the RFP. Um, and I understand sometimes that the Brown Act can frustrate the council's desires. If the council desires to do that, the direction to council to staff would be put the RFP on the agenda for our next meeting, because that would be the more, that would be the proper direction. Because from transparency and from Brown Act, you didn't know you didn't notice that as an alternative tonight. What you said is extend. But if that is the council's direction, it can be carried out and it can be brought back to you in two weeks. Um, that, so I just want to make sure we don't. I'm more concerned. Why don't about you that. stop us earlier? I wanted to see what direction you're going to give to staff. <laughs> well, uh, if I can, Mr. Mayor, I, I think legal minds can disagree on this, and I think that you're being extremely cautious because you're 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 interpreting this very narrowly, uh, Madam City Attorney. Because I think we do have the ability to, under the scope of this agenda item, we're talking about um, you know our hall our trash haulers contract and there's no reason why we can't amend it this is this, this isn't some random amendment we've been talking about going to procurement on this so there's legislative history that shows that we've been talking about that as an option Let's start the clock as as, as as a deputy city manager just stated he was going to bring this back in 30 days with that option and and I this is what makes this challenging um, I maybe the way that the staff report we, we could have structured it is to have that alternative. It could have been, hey, we need 30 days, council, but if you still want to do the RFP, that stays there. So I understand that, and if you want, if you tonight said, bring us back an agenda item that says to do that, it's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? If the council says, if the direction to staff is, bring back a staff report in two weeks that does the RFP, we're going to know what you want to do, and they're going to get started in that direction. It does the same thing, but just the way the staff report was drafted, there was no alternative to the council to, to, to do the RFP tonight. So pretty much, Mr. Mayor, start the clock. Start the clock. Um, we were you know, pretty much just given just one option here tonight. And again, um, is this because the, the city staff just assumed that the city council was going to support the 30-day extension? Because now, obviously, 
You have f four people that saying no, so why would you just give one option? That, that, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of unclear. We've had discussions in the past, and I guess this is, again, why it gets so frustrated. Our processes, we don't have them. It's what, you know, and, and, and I don't mean to beat up Mr. Cortez. I don't mean to beat up our staff uh, in, in any point or form, but I'm, I'm very direct when it comes to a process and sticking to that process and making sure that we have options as a council that when you're get, when, when the city council is giving direction, I think always we get a response from our staff to give their recommendation, but they should always give options. And here again, no option. It's either 30-day continuance or not, right? And so I, I agree with Councilman Sarmiento that we do have history, and so, you know, I'm not sure. But that's what I think is part of that history. The council's decision tonight can be go back and formally do that, bring us the package and the analysis that does that. Um, the other factor I think that's weighing okay. into this, and I, it's difficult without having staff here, is that in the next year, regardless of who your waste hauler is, you're going to need to implement some new environmental laws. Right, and regardless of who that is. And I think part of what staff is analyzing is the cost of that, whether it's our current hauler or whether that contract expires in June. I believe, my understanding, it's that information that they want to go back and analyze so that when they come back to you, they can say, council, one option is forget all of this. We want an RFP, period. That's all we're doing. Or number two, we want to stay with the current provider. Or number three, we want to make sure we have a backup plan in case that current provider isn't available. That's my understanding. Ms. Garba, I'll go ahead and make the amendment to bring this back, but I'll tell you, you all had two and a half years, two and a half years to do this analysis. So again, that's where I, 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 I'm perplexed because we've been having this discussion for two and a half years with all this analysis. We've all known. I sat on the Orange County Waste uh, Management Commission purposefully because I knew this was coming up and I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to, to be studied and understanding the environmental impacts and the new laws. And I sat there for three years knowing that this was going to come to play and we had two and a half years. We went out and got a consultant to do X, Y, and Z. And so you you all giving me the rhetoric that you know we need to do analysis. We had all that time to do so, but I'll go ahead and make an amendment so, to bring back the RFP. So should we rescind the previous motion? Yeah, but we already voted and the other one passed. Oh. Yes, so no, no, well, you're we reconsidering. Didn't do the nose, it got stopped in the middle of the vote. No, I thought we voted, we voted. four to no. two. No, there was no call for the nose. It, there was an interruption. There was four yeses. Madam Clerk, didn't you take the vote, the yeses. right? I took the vote to, um, after the mayor called the vote. Um, he reported a 4 2 vote. Because right. there were that four yeses. And and two that, that was not and called because I never voted. All right, let's rescind it. Can we rescind yeah. it? How do we rescind it then? Of the substitute motion by the maker of the motion. Yes, that's correct. go ahead, please, I'll Mayor. Yeah. yeah, I'll rescind and reconsider uh, my motion, but I need uh, the a second, second. To, to 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 agree to consider agree. to consider. Say yes. I'm not going to. I'm not going to second that. I completely disagree with the analysis. Oh. By and I, and I really, really respect the city attorney, but that is not. That's just a depart. If we were to designate a hauler at this meeting, that would be a departure from the scope of this agenda item. For us to do something as, as close to a nexus as we can to this, saying that we're going to go out to procure, yeah. uh, Madam and City I, Attorney, I just I agree. don't, I and, can't and get behind I, You know, this council knows um, I provide excessively conservative advice when it comes to Brown Act issues and conflict issues. I do believe that your policy will be carried out because it is clear from the vote that you took that four of you believe that you want to do the RFP. It'll be brought back to you in, in two weeks, and the, the message to the, to the staff is loud and clear. But it does, in per, for purposes of our transparency, I just, it, if it was an alternative, and I'll, and I'll talk with staff about providing those alternatives on the staff report, because I think the issue here is, would the public have known that you were going to do that tonight? That's all. We're doing this publicly, Madam City Attorney. We're not doing this in the I back know, room. I know, but the Brown Act requires that the action that you're going to take has to be described on the agenda or in the report in 20 words or less. And there's abs the, the staff report is less than one page, and there's not one discussion in the staff report mentioning that an RFP might be the issue. So I'm just, I understand that. I understand some people might take issue with that. I, I tend to be conservative on the Council Councilmember Solorio, please. Uh, yes, you know, for me, I'm mainly just frustrated with 
really what's poor staff work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I for me, at the end of the day, I don't care whether we go out to, to, to bid or not, but the, the key staff that worked on this aren't here. Uh, for all we know, the, the hauler may have submitted the proposal two weeks or, or a month in, uh, and just staff's That's been... Right. You know, and, and to their benefit, I know they've been doing extra community outreach and figuring out the laws, um, but it's really c kind of on staff. And so even none of the staff, I don't think, told the incumbent holler that it was important to be here. Uh, I don't know who to, who to blame for that. So for me, I just also don't think it's fair to punish the uh, incumbent holler for bad staff work. Uh, so, you know, maybe we just bring this back in two weeks with, you know, the final analysis and one of the options being to, to, to bid out. Uh, I think I think that would be fair. And either way, it's going to need to come back uh, with an, an option also for, for bidding out. So maybe just instead of coming back in, in 30, it comes back in, in two weeks. They've had long enough. Is, I guess, is that a motion? Yeah, I would move that. I'll, I'll second it just so that we can bring our option back because uh, I don't want to be in violation of the Brown Act. And I do agree with Councilman Sarmiento, but I'm just, again, just beyond, beyond frustrated, beyond perplexed, um, and very disappointed in our staff. I am very disappointed that you know how important this, that this is to us, how important it is to this city, to the residents, and that this is how we're treating a $150 plus million dollar contract over 10 years. That's the most disappointing part for me. Um, and I, I All just right, we have a motion can't believe it. And a second for the record. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. We have one no. You know, I, I, I know we Go have ahead. the discussion's over, but I, I do want to also state for the record that this item de did come before council numerous times. It was continued numerous times by council. So at this point, I understand that we're, we're all frustrated and we could have and should have taken care of and addressed things some time back. But to scapegoat staff at this point, that, that, that really is frustrating to me because we took some action, we continued things, and, and it is really frustrating to me that, that at this point now we're, we're putting it all on staff. Uh, action has been taken, two weeks we'll come back and, and uh, we'll, we'll see what they present and we'll take action at that point. But I just did want to state uh, that for the record as well. All right, so with that, we move on to item 65C. And I have um, Sandra DeAnda wishing to speak on this item. She left. What about uh, Daylene Rodriguez? And then after that, uh, Johnny Bautista. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you for giving me the space to speak tonight, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Zelin Rodriguez, and I'm here because as you all continue to talk about support for the DACA program, I want us not to forget about the rest of undocumented communities that do not fit the Dreamer narrative. I believe we should, not, we should not be measured by the amount of degrees or for our economic contribution. I want us to stop the criminalization of my parents, cousins, aunts, uncles, friends, and co-workers. We're not tokens to be traded. We are humans trying to thrive. I do not want something that is going to benefit myself and leave my family out. I do not want to live in fear of losing them to deportation. I thought I had left that back in Guatemala when we left the violence and the death uh, threats. Um, I want us to continue this fight, and not just for uh, the 100,000 of us, but also for the rest of the 11 million undocumented immigrants that are here. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker, I think I called you earlier. Please come on down. Um, good evening, Council, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first of all, I want to commend you for the actions that were taken for the legal defense funds for, uh, to provide our undocumented community uh, legal representation should they need it. Um, I also want to thank you for the pending resolution for urging Congress to pass a Clean Dream Act, um, hopefully this year. Uh, but I hope that we can take real steps for fighting to protect all members of our immigrant community because if we exclude them from the conversation, uh, I feel that we may indirectly 
uh, be uh, validating the uh, demonizing rhetoric that we've been hearing from uh, the federal government. And so um, even though uh, the, res the rescinding of, of DACA was unfortunate and 25% of those 800,000 uh, 800, people are Californians, uh, we can't forget about the other 10 million people. And I hope that um, I hope that we can do something to, to and be more inclusive. And just for the record, you were uh, Mr. Rodriguez or Bautista? Bautista. Got it. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Daylin Rodriguez. All right. Uh, Jose Servin. And then uh, Phoebe Giacomi, I believe it is. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, I just wanted to come out today in support of um, Agenda Item 65C. I really appreciate what you all are doing. And um, I'd like to ask you all to, um, I know items like these are in support of vulnerable communities, but um, I think that those of us that do have DACA, though we're at threat of losing it, are um, pretty, um, uh, I, I'd say we're pretty advantaged compared to those of us are those in our community that don't have it, right? The other 10 million people who couldn't, um, who don't fall under its scope. Um, but because of those people, we're able to be where we're at because of the sacrifices of our parents and our community members. So while I appreciate what y'all are doing, um, and it means a lot, if y'all could make your resolution a little broader and include um, some, of us, some of those in our community that are seen as criminals, are seen as non-productive because they don't go to school because they didn't get to wear a graduation cap um, that would that would mean a lot especially to those of us that are able to do what we do because of them um, so yeah thank you that's all I had to say today come on down and after, uh, after yourself Eric Garcia and then Claudio Gallegos want you to start to step forward please go ahead um, hi, good night, almost good morning. Um, my name is Fabi Hakome. I've been here enough. Um, I'm the program coordinator with Orange County Immigrant Youth United. Um, and here I am, uh, I'm here to echo what the rest of our membership has said. Um, again, we want to say thank you to the um, council members that have been supportive of immigrant rights work being done here in the city of Santa Ana. Um, and we, it, it's really amazing for us to know that y'all see us and the work that we're doing. Um, which is why reading the resolution kind of made me like take a double look because, or double take, um, because it says uh, to protect innocent youth from deportation. Um, you all are a city that has been working in the Invest in Youth campaign, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and a lot of the local organizations, uh, aside from us, has been pushing that. And the fact that there is a school to prison pipeline um, that is going on. Unfortunately, there have been attacks to the immigrant community from all sides, including um, you know, gang databases and just the fact that those folks are not priority for deportation. Um, and the, just the, the sometimes shitty work that the police department is doing. Um, and so as much as we are um, very happy that you are uh, supporting us, uh, and I know that this is mainly symbolic, we do ask that you please remove the innocent uh, youth uh, from this um, resolution, just because it doesn't include everybody. Um, and those are the folks that, again, have to go through the, from the school to prison pipeline. A lot of folks that didn't have um, the privilege of going to school, uh, a lot of the folks that don't identify with the Dreamer narrative, um, and whether it's the Dream Act or any other bill that is passed or that is put forward um, legislation, we do also ask that you continue supporting uh, something that will um, include all 11 million of us, including our parents, our community members, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, folks that don't have family here um, and that don't fit into that perfect good uh, immigrant or good Dreamer narrative. Thank you. Okay, uh, Eric, and then Claudio. Uh, good evening, Council, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for having us. Uh, again, just to, to echo uh, the same uh, sentiments that uh, my colleagues uh, pretty much came up here and expressed, is that the, 
um, as we saw earlier um, with Nancy Pelosi up north in the San Francisco election, and we saw activists out there uh, make a push for the 11 million, um, because we've 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 understood that uh, DACA recipients or the Dreamer narrative per se has set up a box, um, exact which is exactly what we anticipate um, state legis state legislators intended, in that it's a very exclusive box, and that it excludes. 10 million folks. It excludes um, the rest of our community. Um, to say that that we are um, in, in within the resolution to protect the innocent youth, again, it's very exclusive. And and a lot of the work that we're doing in, in Santana, which we were recognized for previously, along with all the other orgs, um, revolves around the idea that we're advocating for our community as a whole. We are a vulnerable, vulnerable community, but we are advocating for us as a whole. And um, we just urge you all to, again, not exclude us or, or I am I am no less right or no more innocent than my parents uh, who brought me here, and that's what ultimately what we want to stress is that we want the res we we applaud the resolution and we applaud your support of the Dream Act, except we we want it to broaden and and cover as much of our community as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudio. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I come here on um, representing Congressman Luke Correa and would like to read a statement from him. Outside of my DC office, a large sign reads, Dreamers Welcome. I strongly support Dreamers and our immigrant communities. Immigration is one of my top priorities, and I am committed to improving the lives of all of my constituents. Since taking office in January, I have held numerous town halls with immigration experts and lawyers and have held a citizenship fair. I have authored and co-authored 23 immigration bills, including three bills that provide dreamers with a pathway to citizenship, protect sanctuary cities, and help deported veterans get medical care. When President Trump announced he would increase immigration enforcement and build an unnecessary wall, I invited a dreamer from Santa Ana to join me at the State of the Union. This young man was there to show the best dreamers have to offer. In Washington, I am working with my colleagues to secure legislative solutions that give dreamers permanent protection. Without legislation, dreamers' future are in danger, but there is hope. We are, getting, we are working to get the DREAM Act brought up for a vote. More and more members are joining our cause every day, and I will keep working until this gets done. Dreamers follow the law and have studied and worked hard to become contributing parts of our community and our country. A majority of Americans, including 69% of Republicans, support a pathway to citizenship for them. We must keep fighting and keep hope alive. As a member of Congress, I will continue to fight for comprehensive immigration reform and to protect all immigrant families. And with that, we, um, it is the official position of the congressman to um, approve the motion tonight and to guarantee that he is working hard and welcomes the support of our local jurisdictions to find a solution. Thank, Thank you. you. I also have um, what he has been working on in Washington on immigrants' rights for all seven of you. Thank you. With that, let me bring uh, to Council for uh, discussion and consideration. Councilman Solorio. Yeah, a, a question for uh, one of the reps from the from the youth organization, maybe Fabio, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I'm kind of hearing two things. I just want to hear what your preference is. Uh, one is to just simplify the resolution so it's more specific just to dreamers o overall no, without the, details. Let, let, let me continue. Sorry. Or maybe you know a resolution that just speaks to broader immigration reform. Right. I think the right. ask from us as well as um, organizations throughout the state and the nation um, is that we, if there is uh, local support, that it's not specific to the dreamer narrative right. or like undocumented or immigrant youth that are um, that fit, maybe don't call themselves dreamers, but are still inside that little box. So I think the the que the ask is for a, uh, a resolution or a show of support uh, to immigrant youth 
um, whether it be the DREAM Act or any other bill, that what we're calling a clean bill, meaning, right. meaning no... But just young people, but also adults as well, or you're still just only focused well, on... Well, right now, a lot of the attention is on immigrant youth, right? Okay. So as immigrant youth, we are asking for your support for all 11 million, um, but we do know that there is, or there are different pieces of legislation moving through um, our... moving through the, the Congress and, and the Senate, and so the... the ask is for you all to support a clean bill, meaning no further enforcement, um, as well as no more militarization of the border, or at the border. I mean, my, my, my only preference would be, and that, that was my question, thank you. My, my, I'm supportive of the, the way it's written. I think it's written very well. Uh, but I also see that something else that spoke more generally just to support uh, comprehensive immigration reform bills that are, that are good, uh, as well as uh, uh, Dream Act type of bills because there's going to be many as well. So we also don't want to just say one type of uh, a Dream Act bill. So uh, I mean, I like the idea of just generalizing it, but I, I too would like to see just comprehensive immigration reform uh, overall. But again, I think staff I, did good, good work on this as well, and I'm supportive of it. Thank you, thank you, Juan. You don't have to speak. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I'm for, uh, I'm for the DACA. I'm for uh, immigration reform overall. There's a lot of seniors out there that could use some help that are also in positions like that. Some of them haven't gone back to their, their uh, homeland to visit because they're just too old and they're um, at a disadvantage. But, uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to abstain from this vote because there's some of the language in here that I don't agree with. I like the second part, the last part the, of the letter that's going to go out. But the first five, six paragraphs of the of the resu, I I don't agree with some of the language in there, so I'm going to abstain. But I will, I will write my own letter of support. That I will do. Thank you for that, Councilor David Benavides. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the speakers who came to address us and for uh, hanging in there. It's been a number of hours. Um, definitely understand the the. Uh, uh, position and the request for a council to take a position, requesting that we take a position in support of comprehensive immigration uh, reform, and that it that uh, something that is not uh, so specific to to DACA uh, students or Dreamers, uh, and we have taken a position a, a, n a number of different times as a council. Uh, uh, in support of immigration reform. We've called on Congress uh, over the years as there have been different pieces of le legislation that Congress has been uh, working on. Uh, this, this specific resolution was intended to be very specific. It was di in direct response to the attacks of, of the presidential dis administration against uh, the, the, the DACA uh, students throughout the country. Uh, so it, it's that that is at different times we'll take up different uh, items and issues that are affecting our community. This one is again an indirect response. Although I, I think from even some of the comments which you're hearing tonight, uh, we I, I definitely would be willing to, and I think most of my colleagues, if not all, would be willing to take an additional step. Basically, it doesn't have to end here uh, with this resolution. Uh, we we can bring something back, especially if there is something. Uh, specific legislation or, or specific uh, yeah, piece of legislation that Congress were to consider uh, that would be uh, addressing uh, comprehensive immigration reform or, or, or something in, in, in general as well. So I, I think the intent tonight is specifically to, to stand up and speak up on behalf of, of uh, DACA students who are specifically being targeted by uh, the Attorney General and, and, and the President. Uh, but again, we can go ahead and, and feature, uh, do something that, that is uh, more at the uh, recommendation or, or input based on, on some of the speakers tonight. Councilmember Sarmiento, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I know that I think the council member is right. I think when we took this up during public comments, it was maybe three days after the president had decided to rescind the program, right? So it was kind of specific to this, and it was a reaction to that. And he's right. There is a history, a legislative history that we have. We've adopted resolutions in the past that have supported just general comprehensive immigration reform that encompass all immigrants, all 12 million, right? Um, but maybe if I could be allowed to do some wordsmithing, um, uh, Madam City Attorney, this might 
help because it'll be consistent with what we've adopted in the past while at the same time being specific to um, to this uh, to, the, to the DACA program and the DACA students and, and folks within that program. So it would read, consideration of resolution calling upon the United States Congress to immediately pass the DREAM Act of 2017 and to protect strike innocent and replace it with immigrant youth and families from, excuse me, youth and families from deportation. So maybe that is consistent with um, resolutions that we've adopted in the past while at the same time being very specific uh, with, uh, with the DACA program. If that's the motion, I'll second. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to read something so I should be finished very quickly. So it's simple for me on why I support DACA and the need for immigration reform. This country was founded by immigrants, and, it's, and it is because of immigrants who contributed to making this land we call home. I'm a fourth-generation Mexican-American born in the United States who embraces dignity and unity. The late Senator James William uh, Fulbright said that the establishment of a, har of a harmonious relationship of people is only possible when differences of culture and, and outlook are respected and appreciated rather than feared and condemned when the common bond of human dignity is re recognized as the essential bond for, for a peaceful world. I understand that people really struggle with the differences of others and the attempts to sometimes co coerce others to change how they act and feel so that they will fit their perfect mold of what is accepted. But we must remember that we need to carry ourselves in a way that reflects noble character and healthy regard for others, especially if you are an elected official. Hence, people do wish to make a, mean, a meaningful difference in their community, and I believe that these DACA recipients are making meaningful contributions to society. One of my favorite people in the world, Gandhi, said, be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to enjoy peace, promote peace. I do my best to represent these powerful words every day. If we stop and think about it, we are all enlarged by those who are different than we are. We all have a deep desire to belong. I do my best to do things for the greater good, and I believe that DACA, these, the, the, these students and the, these families here in particular in this community and throughout California have represented that, and so I wholeheartedly support. Can we uh, make the suggestion that uh, Councilor Sarmiento made the motion and would that be that would be an amendment, right? That you're to to the staff recommendation or whatever. Correct. So, I'd so let's with, do that. And I think we had a second from Solorio uh, or Benavides. Okay. So, all right, he thirds it. So with that, uh, any more discussion? If not, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion carries. Let's go on to the next item, 75A. This is a public hearing to adopt an ordinance for the registration of abandoned and defaulted residential commercial property and a resolution to add a $480 fee for service in the fiscal year 2017-18. Miscellaneous fee is continued. You want to continue this to October 3rd? All right, so I'll entertain a motion to continue so this. Mr. Mayor, I'll just support that. I just want to, um, these abandoned properties, are these banked owned? Yes. And can I can we get a total number of what those are? Because when we're talking about affordable housing and 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 housing ownership, the reality is that the banking industry owns a lot of these shadow properties here in this community and they're not letting them out into the market. And so I think this is a perfect step for us to to continue to increase these fees, but they are part of the problem. And so if we can, you know, maybe do a little bit digger deep dive on how many who and who are the banks that actually own these properties would be greatly appreciated. We'll bring you what we can if we adopt this system then we will have specific data. That's one of our So you don't have it now. now? We don't have all of the addresses that are bank owned. This would give us that because they would need to register. Okay, fantastic. But we'll still tell you what we think the, the, if, the magnitude of the problem is. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. All right, so with that we have a, a motion. Well, no, not yet. Uh, uh, to continue. To continue. We have a motion to continue. I have a second. Yes. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. On 75 B, Madam City Attorney, I've in the uh, the past not voted on 
issues regarding medical marijuana for reasons I said earlier. So I'm going to turn it over to Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. At this time, we have a public hearing ordinance amendment to uh, 2017 02 to amend the, uh, certain sections of Chapter 18 of the Santa Ana Municipal Code, Medical Marijuana Collectives and Cooperatives. And we provided legal notice to the publisher of the Orange County's Reporter on September 8, 2017. Do we have any members of the public that wish to uh, talk at this uh, time? Any have notices? We any did not. Cards. So the recommendation action is to place an ordinance on the first reading and authorize publication of title. First. We have a second by Samantha. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those in favor, motion carries. Mr. Mayor? All right, I think we're approaching the end of the meeting. So um, I think we've already had all the comments. So city uh, manager comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a, a couple of quick items. I'm, I'm sure someone else is going to talk about the weekend event, so I will let you all uh, uh, talk about it. But it was quite successful, and uh, I just wanted to congratulate our Parks and Recreation and Community Services Agency for another event well done. Uh, they're already starting to plan 2018. Uh, you heard about the Wings of the City event. Uh, we will send something out to the council. You heard from your, your chair of your commission. Uh, I hope the council will put that on their calendar for the opening and the evening of October 27th. Uh, there's a 5K run that's going to take place uh, this Saturday, October 21st at 8 a.m. Uh, starting at the corner of Main and 4th Street. Registration is open. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, for those of you that were able to come to the LA Zoo for their event, uh, it raised $100,000 for the zoo. They have almost met their goal of $600,000 to complete the Giant River Auto exhibit at the zoo. And uh, so we want to congratulate them. Um, they also received a $10,000 grant from the U.S. Bank and $70,000 grant from Macbeth Foundation. So we thank them for contributing to our wonderful zoo. And uh, finally mentioned that National Manufacturing Week is October 2nd to the 6th. There are a number of events. This is a good time to get youth to go through some of our manufacturing facilities, uh, think about some job opportunities that they may not see on a day-to-day -day basis. Rather than go through all the things we've planned, we will post them on the website from our work center. Uh, and uh, as if you have the opportunity to, to tell people that it's a something that they can participate in either by touring Santa Ana businesses or uh, going to Santa Ana College who is hosting two uh, weekend events. They can find out about it and uh, it, it should be a lot of fun. Thank you, Mayor. When, when did you say the run was? October 21st. All right. Thank you. I did said I miss Saturday. I said, oh, no. I think you inadvertently said this Saturday, but it's right. oh, next, next no, it is, month. It is yeah. a Saturday. A Saturday. But yeah. not you were, Saturday. You are so excited. Yes, my apologies. You are so excited. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, who wants to start? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to begin by clarifying something on the, um, on the 90B council member comment. So I wasn't able to make it to the League of Cities, even though it reflects here that I did. So just for clarification, I wanted to join, but I know it was well represented by... Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Solorio, so I ended up staying back. Um, you know, uh, what I did want to do is just mention that um, this weekend's uh, events were great. The parade was really well attended. The weather was perfect. Other times we've had 95 and 100 degree temperature and everybody was just roasting out there, but this time it was very mild. It was fair. I think everybody had a chance to have a good time. Um, and I want to, you know, uh, give some kudos to uh, Acting Chief um, uh, Valentin because I know he was um, uh, approached by some of us here uh, on the council about some potential incidents, disruptions, and um, he and his staff handled it very, very well. So my, um, my congratulations to him and his staff. Uh, but I do think as we consider next year's event uh, as successful as this one was, I think we should maybe look at doing a small ad hoc on that because I know that the footprint of the event changed and it caught some of us off guard. I know it caught me off guard. And just, you know, planning this out. Not, you know, I, I know we do it in conjunction with the consulates, with the Mexican consulate's office, but it's always good to maybe 
get some comment from council members um, and you know the public and, and the participants and obviously the Mexican consulate's office. So I think it's a good idea. Um, I know one year we just did away with the um, with the carnival rides are all together, and it was sort of a unilateral decision, and you know uh, the public was up in arms. So we want to be we want to make changes that are incremental and that are they're going to be um, enhancements. Um, finally, I just want to say how. Um, sad I am about seeing a lot of the video that I saw from Mexico City um, from the earthquake that they suffered. And I know we had an earthquake here that measured 3.6, but um, theirs was 7.1, and it was really an awful sight. And I haven't checked my, um, you know, my my uh, uh, social media yet to see how many lives were actually lost. And they're probably uh, they're probably those numbers are going to just continue to escalate. But um, but it was just a horrible sight to see buildings come down with children and families in them and conclude and um, and you know just say that to the extent that we can send our you know our best wishes to folks that are going through a very difficult time and with that I'll say good night the clock great thank you so very quickly um, I had the opportunity to attend the League of Cities and I still have my application there were various um, opportunities to participate and some of the um, sessions I actually participated of course my favorite you know dealing with CalPERS and so I also um, got to you know pass by the different booths and I saw Kevin O'Rourke and, and, and PARS folks as well and had a conversation with them and you know um, our um, you know our PERS here our, our PARS here with with, with with the city and you know and I mentioned in our, in our meeting yesterday how can we bring them back and have a presentation as it pertains to that and but I did want to make mention you know um, the pension issue is a is still looming uh, amongst all cities and so we're not out um, you know and so we need to figure out a sustainable path to to continuing to address this and I know uh, we're, we're trying to do that but whatever we can do to continue to to put money towards that to, to the unfunded liability is something that we uh, should continue to consider and so I just want to make mention of that. Um, and I think a lot of bills as it pertains, and we've talked about it today, uh, as it pertains to affordable housing bills, that hopefully um, they're going before the governor and he will sign those. But the other important thing that we talked about um, yesterday in our um, committee meeting was this, um, the, the small cell sites at, um, and that law come into play and how we're going to be, we have to prepare ourselves and and position ourselves and you know what how that's going to impact us and it's, it's very disappointing even though hundreds of folks of elected officials stood before the Capitol in opposition of this specific bill um, AT&T still had a strong hold on, on the legislature and still supported um, that and, and, and um, disregarded what local elected officials really felt and how this was going to impact us at the local level. The other exciting part, I think, for me, and I've mentioned it to our, our city manager, is the parks bond. Um, you know, as we're park poor, we continue wanting to build more um, open space. Um, you know, there's an opportunity for disadvantaged communities. Of course, that bond is going to the voters, but I truly believe that uh, uh, throughout California, we're very supportive of, of open space, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will pass. And how do we position ourselves? To, to move forward, and I know the light is red, and so I, I will conclude and just have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councilor Solorio, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, great job uh, to the staff on the, on the Fiestas. I think that they did outstanding work uh, uh, for improvements for next year. A couple things. Uh, having two gritos I don't think is necessarily the, the best thing for, for any community, so an ad hoc committee or something to try to coordinate that as well as where some of these activities are. I know I saw some emails and communications about what part of 4th Street there's activity in or not, and I think there's a good tradition of as much of 4th Street as possible, and I support that. Um, also, I did attend the League of Cities event and attended some great workshops and had discussions regarding the homelessness issues, yes. smart cities, uh, great vendor exhibit. Yeah, well, probably that's one of the best vendor exhibits I've ever seen. Uh, at a workshop on finances, learned about that. Finally, on two other items, uh, I, I, I learned from a workshop that I did with uh, local residents about how to start a small business or business in Santa Ana that uh, our business license form is only available in English. It's not available 
in Spanish or Vietnamese in the city as diverse as ours, uh, we really ought to have our, our business license form uh, in both languages. I also learned that uh, in addition to the long, more complicated business license form, there's something else that has uh, other home-based type of, of fees uh, that in many cases are uh, more modest. Uh, and so we ought to have it all in one form and definitely have it in multiple languages. Finally, one more thing on the homeless thing. We really got to monitor what the, what the sheriffs in Anaheim is doing because a lot of those folks that are getting pushed out, one way or another, are going to come to our city. Uh, and I know that I've approached our police department of coordinating that activity. And, you know, we got to push back. And we've done quite a bit already. Uh, you know, we are compassionate. We are doing a lot. If anything, we want to see a race, you know, to ending the homelessness crisis where others step up in offering housing as well. The enforcement piece is easy. Uh, it's the housing piece that, that that's tough, uh, and we need to work together as part of a shared responsibility, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So thank you. Thank you. Juan Villegas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I just want to thank all the uh, city staff, uh, the uh, Santa Ana Police Department, Orange County Fire Authority for the great job. Uh, this weekend with all the, event, the events. It was a uh, great turnout. It was a success. Um, there was definitely a lot of people there. Uh, I know I was out there all three days, and I just want to thank you again for all your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Benavides. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, I'd also want to join my colleagues in uh, congratulating, commending the hard work of uh, Gerardo Moet and the Parks and Rec staff and all the staff that, that were out there uh, that made a, a very successful event. One of the wonderful things about our city is, is the celebration, the diversity, the culture, and it was wonderfully celebrated this weekend. So thank everybody uh, for that. I, I do want to ask of, of staff, as I, I understand from previous conversations with staff, that there's some consideration of relocating some of the the, uh, the downtown events, particularly the fiestas patrias and, and Cinco de Mayo, uh, over to be uh, uh, by uh, a flower and uh, over by the stadium. Uh, I think some of that information has has uh, has been shared, or it's, there's some of the public uh, that that is aware. However, the way that it's being perceived or being received is as uh, some of these these cultural events being pushed out by some of the downtown businesses. Uh, versus it being something that's led by, by a staff and something that's in preparation, I believe, as well for the streetcar. So it's being misconstrued out there, so we need to do a, a better uh, job uh, of, uh, of, of just getting the information out there and, and making sure that, that it doesn't become something that, that is misreceived, uh, misinformed, or, or even maybe or misconstrued and, and create some, some tension out there uh, in our downtown community. Uh, I, uh, uh, the, the Wings of the City event coming up is, is uh, something I'm very much looking forward to. Just a couple weekends ago, I was in Mexico City with my daughter. And, uh, we had an opportunity to see some of the artwork of, of uh, uh, sculptor uh, Jorge Marin. And, and so then I, I came home and, and saw that this is something that was coming home here to Santa Ana. So I'm very excited about that because it, it definitely caught my attention. It was beautiful artwork out there. Uh, and with, uh, as uh, Councilman mentioned, uh, some of the, the devastation of earthquakes just happened today. I just ask our community to be in, in uh, have Mexico uh, and it starts in prayers and see what we can do to continue to support uh, those uh, that are suffering from, from natural disasters. Uh, and uh, coming up, this, this I've mentioned just that the beauty of our city, uh, the people, and our, our community coming together. I want to invite uh, our community to come out this Saturday, September 23rd, starting at 7.30 in the morning at Santa Anita Park. Uh, there's going to be uh, the, Love, the Love Santa Ana Initiative's next uh, serve day is taking place where uh, several churches throughout the city gather volunteers from faith community, residents, business community, nonprofits to come and just uh, serve and love on our city. So there's going to be a significant amount of beautification taking place at Santa Anita Park. That's, uh, you can get more information at lovesantana.org. Uh, 7.30 a.m. for the serve day, and then at noon there will be a uh, community re resource fair as well taking place, lovesantana.org. Just want to encourage folks to continue to support our community by shopping in the city, uh, supporting local jobs, and uh, doing all of our shopping in, in Santana as we can. With that, have a great evening. Thank you. And start. You just, How long was that, he just, he just used up all your time, Mr. Mayor. So Really? 
Just With that, have a good night. Me, <laughs> I'll make it real quick, but start the light. Okay. As you know, Amazon came out with his announcement a few days ago, talking about you know you know that they want cities to apply. I got a call from the mayor of Garden Grove, uh, you know, who we talked earlier because we were talking about Willowick and all that, and he basically said, "How about if if we just you know put our name in the ring?" I don't think you can just write a letter and say we've got you know this land out there and that that's enough, but. Um, but we have another guy in town named Mike Hara that, you know, has got the building over at the register and one Broadway plaza. So what I'm uh, suggesting considering is that we have nothing to lose. I, I, I just think it's a letter saying, let's see if we make the short list. If we make the short list, then it starts to get real. I know that Irvine has thrown their hat in the ring and there's going to probably be 150 cities if not more across the united states that are going to throw their hat in the ring so i i just want to bring this up tonight because i'm considering just signing a letter along with the mayor of garden grove and let's see if um let's see where it goes we don't need a lot of staff time i'm not asking for money it uh, it's just an opportunity to say hey if Irvine can put their name in the in 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 the, in the hat and see what uh, works out why can't we Frankly, I think we have more to offer. We have the streetcar. We have, you know, uh, downtown. We have the metro link. Uh, we've got um, a diverse community. We have the population that they're asking for. When you look at all the boxes that uh, Amazon's talking about, we can check a lot of those boxes. So with that, but you're saying two letters on the two type of projects, correct? Uh, pretty much. Let's see what he yeah. proposes. Okay. But, you know, something just to try to get our hat in the ring, see where it goes. I don't know that we'll even go into the second round because you're going to have every major city in the country going for that. You have to have a lot more zeal and passion every, and, and, and excitement. We, we, have, well, we have a lot, but I think, you know, if Irvine can do it, I think we can do really, really well. So with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Conference, we take it. Yeah, brand new.